Trekland HQ, and we are live. <laughs> hey, it's my guest, Star Trek history author of The Center Seat, the guide to the TV series, Peter Holmstrom today on episode 303 of Trekland Tuesdays Live. Boom, now we're official. <laughs> With me, Dr. Trek, Larry Nemechek, coming at you from the heart of Trekland through Portal 47 and Trekland Treks for some clarity, sanity, and the big picture in all things Star Trek. Welcome to uh, another Tuesday here, folks, everybody. If you're new with us, welcome, welcome. Glad you found your way here. We've got a great community. The chat room's going to start populating up. There we go. All the TTLers are here. If you're new to us, uh, make sure to introduce yourself, sign in. Now, normally, um, and when you're in the chat, just remember that if you're in YouTube and Twitch, you can see everything. If you're on Facebook, you'll only see the other Facebook comments. And if you're watching all this later on YouTube, well, thanks for being here. But just think, you could have been here live with us <laughs> in the chat. Meanwhile, though, uh, normally you guys know the normal format is there's I'll do it. I'll do a topic. I'll do a soapbox for a little bit and then we'll take a short break, hit the parrot analytics ratings and if whatever there is to see and on Star Trek. And then I'll hit your chat then. All right. So today is our brand new, almost brand new guest format. So I want to bring in our guest here in just a second. Feel free to chat away. I'm going to try to monitor the chat. If you ask something early on, I mean, I want to I want to talk to our guest for a while first, and then we'll see the questions pop up. And I think Peter can see the chat too. But just know that if we don't get to your question, maybe I missed it. So just you know, come back and scream it at me in the chat, and maybe we'll catch it on the second go round. Okay. Well, enough said because I want to plunge right in because I'm still. I mean, I've interviewed people for thirty years, guys, but doing it live on Tuesdays is still kind of a thrill, and doing it. Um, for all the people who, well, you know, the actors get enough attention. I love the behind the scenes folks. Um, but now doing all the th folks who are adjacent to the industry is something I think we can do on Tuesdays Live. And that's why I am thrilled to have with us uh, our guest. He's very excited with what's going on recently. So I'll let him tell you. Um, but hello, Peter. Welcome to Trekline Tuesdays Live. And uh, congratulations on the center seat, the book. Thank you. Thank you. It's it's wonderful to be here. And uh, thank you for, for being a part of the book. You're in that book as well. So it's for uh, uh, from uh, Nichelle from Michelle. <laughs> the Nichelle Company. No way. Nichelle Company. Else. <laughs> Nichelle Brooks, which is adjacent to Brian Volkweiss's Nichelle uh, Company. Yes. Do they put out Nacelle quarterly? I don't know. Or Nacelle monthly? Remember uh, that? I don't know. No, I, I don't that was so. that was J.J. Abrams joke when he first did Star Trek 09. Uh, I and see. he said, it's not Nacelle monthly, like he was knocking <laughs> all the anal. There were people were pointing out how in, in, insipidly stupid having a mile long enterprise was, but <laughs> thought it looked cool. Anybody was thinking, okay, anyway, that's a whole other saga, uh, which, you, is, which yeah. you didn't thankfully have to deal with in the book or the series dealt with in the series. Yeah, I did not. There maybe maybe one day with a sequel. But, yeah. uh, I feel like there needs to be a few more years between between us and, and I, that, exactly, that film series. But, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so where so let's talk about the book and how did you come to it and where where's home right now? Where are you talking to us? From? Uh, I'm here in uh, Los Angeles. Um, oh. Uh, oh yeah, rocking. there you are. Okay. Yes, <laughs> just just around the corner. You know, it's uh, it's great. Um, uh, yeah, and uh, the book kind of came to me. Um, you know, the old fashioned way. Like I I had worked for a few years as a research assistant on uh, some of Mark Altman's and Ed Gross's oh, oral history somebody. book. Okay. Yeah, I knew somebody. Yeah, <laughs> it's uh, it's that that old story. But uh, and yeah, Mark was uh, an EP on the documentary series and, and Brian uh, vocalized and wanted to kind of jumpstart a publishing line for his company. And, um, you know, my name came up as someone who could who could do a good job, you know, adapting mm -hmm. these documentary series into uh, into book format. And so, yeah. I, we should say, just to back up, that the center seat, uh, I was very thrilled to be part. In fact, <laughs> I think I wound up being a very big part of it. You were a big part but, of it. Yes. <laughs> uh, it, was a, it was a big thing, though. It was a 10. Nobody had, uh, with all the documenting and even on the DVD sets and all the hours that have been out there and interviewing and documenting and, you know, the last 10, 12 years, the higher end documenting. But nobody had done a 10 hour. I think it wound yeah. up being 10, maybe a yeah. 10 hour series on Star Trek. I don't think anybody's done a 10 hour series on any <laughs> television title or I even think, movie frame. I mean, as a set, people have done yeah. hours and hours on Star Wars and James Bond and yada yada, but 
you know, um, Bogart movies or something, but I don't think anyone's done a, a, an intact 10 hour series on one title or one franchise. I, I would agree. I think um, it's pretty unique. And, and the fact that they spent as much time as they did, especially on like things like phase two, the animated series enterprise, you know, it's, it's showing love, mm -hmm. I think to, uh, to the spectrum of the, of the franchise pre 2005. Yeah. Yeah. And yes, a lot of those titles, well, you know, original series, next gen, they've been docked out the wazoo. Yes. <laughs> but, but yeah, Enterprise and, um, you know, the Dave Zappone's team are working on a Voyager documentary as they yeah. did the DS9. Yeah. And, but, and a lot of actors are helping support it. And a lot of Enterprise people were like, okay, we're helping you, but it's our time's coming, right? Yes. You know? <laughs> but yeah, nobody, there's been very little spotlight shown on outside of what the, the segments for the DVDs maybe. For. Yeah, and I think it's it's interesting to think about how like for a lot of those DVD segments, they're coming from Paramount. They're getting sifted through the Paramount lens and, and it's, you know, it's marketing, right? Whereas here it's like there's years between them and they're able to, to uh, some people are able to speak a bit more candidly, you know, mm -hmm. and, and feel a bit more uh, willing to and open. And hindsight's twenty twenty with these sort of things too, which is great because it's like, I think now, especially, and I, you know this, far better than I do, but it's like Deep Space Nine and Voyager have been getting such a reappraisal, uh, especially in terms of like the current political climate and how progressive mm -hmm. they were at the time. But I, you know, in the 90s, I don't think anybody was talking about that, <laughs> and, which well, was even, so weird. But and nobody like, in the 90s was talking about, wow, DS9, what a pioneer in serialization. Yeah, that's very true. <laughs> the baby yeah. steps in the serialization. Yeah. Yes. Everyone was annoyed by it, I think. <laughs> it was, well, or just lost. <laughs> or just no, lost. Yeah. No pun intended there. Uh, <laughs> Speaking so it's, it's been wonderful just to like hear the stories and, and be able to tell these stories from a perspective of, of history now, which is really cool. So yeah. you were a writer's assistant on Pandora, which you said was Mark's, yeah. uh, and, and they wanted to set up a book publishing wing. So yeah. awesome. And Brian is certainly, I mean, he went into a toy company too as well. So he's indulging <laughs> all of <Yeah>. his. <laughs> yeah, he's, uh, which is very smart, I think, but business wise. I mean, just looking at how, you know, George Lucas mm -hmm. and Lucasfilm really uh, made their living. It wasn't through the box office success. It was through merchandising. Right. That's where but a lot of the they money did, from. But they did harness, they lived like Kenner. I mean, they access, yeah. they don't license it out to think. But what Brian's doing is starting his own company. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Bypassing the the middleman and going right to it. I mean, and, and starting up publishing companies is one thing. And, and and fraught with, I mean, any, starting anything up is in yeah. media and and these days paper media, I don't envy anyone trying to do old school, you know, or maybe old <laughs> school, but a, a toy come. And I know you're not into the toy thing, but um, but it's like people don't sit up and go, I want to start a toy company today. That's even more interesting than but anyway. I feel like maybe that is actually what happened with Brian. He's, <laughs> he, I think his whole company is kind of indulging his his personal fandom, and that's uh, and that's wonderful, and that's great. It's, and I think he yeah. just wants to see toys made. Uh, what is it they're doing right now? Not Mighty Mouse, but what is the some mouse related thing they're making toys out of? Which I was like, it's some franchise from the '80s or something that I had mm -hmm. never even heard of. But he, I think he just wanted to see toys of those and so things that got overlooked. Yes. Well. <laughs> <laughs> well, I should say also Brian's company, his cell company, did the toys that made us, yeah. uh, the movies that made us. Um, what's the um, yeah the toys that made us? But I I know that especially he really got on my radar because friends you know like uh, John Tenuto and and Mary Teresa Tenuto and and others I think yeah. Doug Drexler talked on uh, the ones that had to do with Star Trek and I think even yeah. even a, a feel from that so that's kind of where it came on my radar. I'm like oh this is awesome so I'm yeah. I'm really happy for Brian uh, yeah. and, and what they've studied and apparently feeding the geekdom now across yeah. all franchises. Yeah. But enough about them. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about you and this thing. So yeah. did they come to you and say, we, we'd like to have a, you know, in our expanding empire here, after we do the 10 hour documentaries, if that wasn't enough, we wouldn't have a, it's not a coffee table book. It's not <laughs> tons of color pictures, but I mean, we no. want to have a companion volume to go with it. And they just said, would you do it? Or how did that work? Pretty much. I mean, it was it was kind of a, you know, your standard work for hire situation where uh, they had a concept that they wanted to pursue and, and they were looking mm -hmm. for someone who who could do it. And, you know, because I'd worked with Mark on on his uh, Star Wars book and his uh, John Wick book, um, you know, he, he he was able to recommend me just because it's like I, I 
knew the format and I knew the workload that was entailed. And, you know, the, at the time, the deadline was very steep, too. So it was someone who could turn stuff in the ground very quickly. Um, <laughs> oh, but, gosh. Uh, yes. Why is it always the way? It's yeah. always the way. It's uh, uh, I remember you telling me the story a while ago about your first book and the crazy deadline there. And I was like, uh, yeah, made me the, shake. Blue, <laughs> the blue TNG companion, I was originally given three months to do that. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> From which, start which, to finish. I mean, it's, which, uh, yeah, yes. you know, I, I think like mine, I, I had the benefit of having kind of the documentary series and the interviews and everything. And, and for you, I, I think you had to start from the ground up, which is just terrifying. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, on one hand, they said, because I, I was wanting to do an encyclopedia. I'd basically done an encyclopedia annually on my own before yeah. Mike and, and, and before, hell, before Memory Alpha. You know, it yeah. was yeah. Bijo's idea on steroids. Yeah. yeah, for the campaign. But anyway, but then it expanded to six months because Leonard was in a licensing image fight with uh, That's right, yeah. over over the post uh, Fred and Barney Pebbles commercial <laughs> with Vulcan ears on. But anyway, yeah. Um, but yes, I, and I don't know why it is, but every aside from occasionally somebody lucky gets a year or two to work on something and it always looks great. But I was very much aware that I had to do something because I didn't want to be a, a pile of junk on people. You know, like, oh, look at this. They're cramming us down our throats. It's a pile of crap. And <laughs> They're just wanting our ten dollars from us, you know, kind of yeah. thing. And I knew, and I wanted it to be on the shelf the way Bejo's companion book and and uh, a concordance and um, Steve Whitfield's, uh, you know, the classic making of book was on everybody's shelf to this day still. Yeah. So you feel that pressure. So no, pr I mean, how, how long did you have? And no pressure, much, right? Yeah, I, I had uh, basically <laughs> two months um, for this one, and uh, I'm sorry, how much? Two two months, two months, uh, and it uh, it was you know it was a lot of work, but it was also like so very. I mean, it's stuff we love, right? So in a way, mm -hmm. even though it's stressful, it, it's such a fun way to to make a living, just because we're talking about stuff we we love to do. So it's uh, I love to talk about. So. Yeah. Um, you know, yes, it was definitely a lot of work, but it, uh, but it was, it was a well, fun time. I mean, just the compression and you worry that you're being able to, I mean, it's the same thing in production. I mean, you know, yeah. visual effects people say, gosh, we could have made a better pass if we just had, you know, one more day to work on it or not be up at 3 a.m. Or yeah. I mean, everybody who care, I mean, sometimes that's the burden of the per people who care versus the uncaring, you know, can't care people versus the ones who do like yeah. you, like me, like so many. And sometimes the business model relies on that. That's a nice sure. way of saying <laughs> <laughs> they know you'll do it for, you yeah, know, we'll whatever it, yeah. and stay up <laughs> all night to work on it. <laughs> but, but how, so what was the, so you had this 10 hour series and the transcript. So did, is this just, um, and it's an audio history, which means uh, you have some narrative passages, but a lot of it is just the, you know, it's the um, straight it's, transcripts from, and the it's people, a, yeah. kind of the chat. It's kind of the format that Mark and Ed Gross write, write their books in. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, what, how much of this was like looking through transcripts and how much of it was did you get to do some original interviewing um a, a little bit i mean as you know firsthand I mean, they, it's two they, months they, so i i think i know my answer but yeah. well yeah i mean they they did do a, a extensive amount of interviews for the documentary series i believe your interview was actually 10 hours total yeah, or something well, like over, that it was very long it's over four days yeah um and oh, uh, 10 hours yeah uh uh, so for me, it was, you know, unfortunately, like, uh, as much as I, I do love the tran the automated transcription software that's out there, I don't find they're very good. So I had to kind of go through it all and transcribe it myself. Well, and not for Star Trek because and not for Star, Star Trek, Trek exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Cause it's all, you know, every time there's a word that, you know, the trans it, I always get it wrong. And then, uh, you know, so I basically went through all the interviews and just transcribed them all myself. And, uh, in so doing, you know, you, you just as you're kind of going through all the interviews, you kind of naturally start to form a narrative inside your own head. Because when I was working on it, um, actually, it was a couple of years ago now that I was working on this book. I was writing it before the documentary series even came out. So I didn't oh, even okay. I didn't even really know like what they were, you know, fo going to focus on. So I was just kind of like, right, th thinking about it, like my own way, just like, what's the kind of natural narrative progression that this this will likely turn into. Um, and so it was fun in a weird way. It's kind of like editing my own documentary in my own head, just, you know, yeah. taking the full brunt of the interviews and and um, and in that way, able to kind of make it much more fleshed out because, you know, just the documentary format, it, it's a lot of, you know, quick sound bites. And it's it's kind of, you know, they're using a lot of clips and they're using, you know, creating mm -hmm. stories based on more sentences, whereas for me in this in this thing, I was able to use paragraphs and I was able to use full 
your full 10 hour <laughs> interview. <laughs> and well, I really uh, thought it was more than 10 hours. It could a couple have, of it, days, it was like yeah. four hours in a day. But um, uh, okay, so so now I'm confused. So because we ha I haven't got to talk to you about this much. So you yeah. said you had two months, but then you said you were working on it two years ago. So yeah. so yeah, you know, they, I mean, and because this was I mean, did you have to first... turn it in two years yeah. ago. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Because okay. Nacelle was kind of starting up their publishing stuff, they, mm. they, they, you know, I think this is something that's great about Brian in a way is he'll just jump into the deep end of things. Like he, he, you know, because I think so much of us in in Hollywood and, and in this industry just get so afraid after a while and just mm -hmm. we'll think like, wouldn't it be great to self finance our own movie? And then like two weeks into thinking about it and working on it, we'll be like, this is really hard. Let's not do this. <laughs> and, and this uh, is really risky. And, yes, exactly. Uh, yeah. And I think Brian just jumps right on in. But, uh, you know, the, what ended up happening was there was some, you know, uh, stuff that had to get figured out, they had, you know, just in terms yeah. of their own publishing line and their infrastructure and things like that. So right, right. it ended up being- Well, you were the guinea, I said you were going to be the guinea pig. Yes, you'd be, exactly. You'd be, the cat, you'd be the canary in the coal mine. If, yeah. No. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, so, yeah, it's been a bit of a slower rollout. But then, like, I know this year they have like eight or something books coming out. And, you know, three oh, of them okay. are going to be from me. And and then I know John and, and Mary at Tenuto are, are working on one. And uh, I think Ed Gross has a bunch coming out from from well, what, as well. So what are they? Can you talk about it yet? Yeah, I mean, my you know, they're currently up for pre-order on Amazon if anybody wants to pick them up. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so Nacelle has continued to do more documentary series in the vein of the center seat. And they, they're doing a series called icons unearthed, which is all about like, and it's through vice right now. It's the vice channel. Um, and, uh, they did one on star Wars. They did one on the Simpsons. They did one on the fast and the furious. And so I've kind of become their like in-house, like novelizer, novelizer. That's not the right word, but uh, <laughs> adapter of the documentary series into, into book format. So. So uh, oh, I have one okay. on Star There's Wars. a nice cottage industry to have. Then yeah, yeah it's fun. Yeah, it's it's yeah. it's really it's really it's been really rewarding. Um, so worked on I uh, did one on the Star Wars franchise, which is coming out soon. Um, I did how, one. How, how big is the documentary that they're planning for Star Wars? Well, it it was uh, six episodes. I think it came out That's last year, last fall. Oh, okay. And, uh, I totally. So so Star Trek's title is still intact. It's still the longest documentary yes, series, yes, right? yeah. okay. Okay. yes that's all that's all that matters. there ought to be there's more hours of star trek than there are of anything that, so. that, that, that is true that's mm -hmm. very true <laughs> um and uh yeah so i did one on the star wars franchise i did one they had gotten an interview with uh marsha lucas who was george lucas's wife uh mm -hmm. during the original trilogy period and they had kind of wanted to do a book that was focused mostly on her and mm -hmm. kind of expand out her interview into like a full-fledged uh book and so i i did a book that was kind of like trying as best I could to tell her story from her point of view uh, about Star Wars, which yeah. is a little hard because, you know, George is kind of the guy. <laughs> and, and No, no, no. There, it's but, it's uh, like, you know, after 30, 40, 50 years, I think there's room for all the other voices, especially so. yes. you know, his <laughs> wife so. at the time. Yes. Yeah. I, yeah. Uh, so, you know, <laughs> did the did the best I could there. Um, and then uh, working on one right now that's about the Simpsons. And uh, wow. that will be uh, all three of those books will be hopefully coming out later on this year. Don't forget Tracy Ullman. Uh, well, actually, yeah. I mean, there's a, a whole chapter just about that. So good, it's, good, good. it's, it's kind of like the Lucy and Desi chapter of of this, only for The Simpsons. It well, is, let's, yeah. Let's, well, let's talk about the center seat. Yeah. So what, um, obviously the, the documentary was happening and you were, you were, so you were seeing transcripts of interviews before it was edited down, the finished Yeah, so it was just edit. the raw. Right, the raw so you didn't see yeah. where the thrust of things was. Yeah. Um, so was it, I mean, pretty organic? What's, what was the hardest thing? This is tripe questions, I know, but like, what was the hardest thing? What was the, what was the most surprising thing? I don't know that we're talking all these chapters from, from roots of Desi and Lucy yeah. through the cage, through the end of Enterprise, right? Yeah. Yeah. And a big chunk of this about 70s fandom and the revival era, even. Uh, yeah. Um, the film. I think, you know, for me, in a lot of ways, it's, it's hearing the stories from the people that don't always talk as much, right? Mm -hmm. It's like they have Larry Niven in there who did an interview, who mm -hmm. wrote an episode of, of the animated series and is a very accomplished uh, sci-fi novelist. And and they got him to talk, which was fascinating. And also just to learn that, like, he had also written, like, two other scripts for the animated series that, you know, were rejected or, mm -hmm. or uh, which I was just like, wow, that's so interesting because... Um, 
and uh, I, yeah, you know the the stuff about Lucille Ball was really cool as well. I think that had been something, not just the null. I think I had known previously that she had, you know, her. I mean, obviously, there's the credit at the end of the at the end of the episodes, but um, I think what's so interesting is to learn kind of the full story behind it all. She was very important, but she was also like, you know. Uh, uh, it was like the ultimate studio op. She had no interest in the details. She had no interest in the details. She yes, just knew right. the concept and she said, I want to do something crazy and bold and we're going to, we're going to either make it or break it. And they, although I've seen, I don't know if you get into this, but the revisionist thinking about, Oh look, she broke the studio just like the old guard thought she would with Matt, with mission impossible and Star Trek. Right. But then somebody said, no, no, look, look how much like she bought out Desi for, and then look at the value she got from Paramount. So she made a ton of money. She made a ton and of a, money. And a lot yeah. of the board got their severance. I mean, you know, got their stock share checks. So the value of Desi, it's not like she broke the studio and Paramount <laughs> got it for pennies. Yeah. You know, and all the properties they're in. Anyway. I'm, I'm, yeah. Well, and I think <laughs> that's what's so fascinating, too, is you're hearing both sides of that story and, and able to relate it in that way so in a way because history especially of this sort is is made up so much by perception mm -hmm. and by by uh subjective opinions on things and, and, and so like there are those by people the winners that, <laughs> and by the winners exactly yeah so it's it's so interesting <laughs> to hear like there are people that are like lucille ball was the single most important person in star trek there are other people that will say like she had no idea what star trek was <laughs> and and was kind of just like signing off you know she was kind of the figurehead of the company and didn't really have active involvement day to day. And there's evidence for both sides of that. And that's really interesting to, you know, there's some people that claim she was on set, you know, helping clean up after day one. And then there's other people that was like, she literally had no idea what Star Trek was. And, yeah. um, and it's fascinating to, to kind of look into that sort of Rashomon approach to, to history. Um, yeah. I, I love that. So it's, well, uh, yeah. that's, so there's a thing. In fact, there was, I want to make, there's, I was like, there was, I was zooming through. I, I didn't get a chance. I got, I we, it was delayed, but I did get my book uh, yes. maybe five or six days ago. I'm so glad you got it. And I had a, yeah, no, it was awesome. And I had a, uh, I had a Yuri's night and a few other things in between. So I was scanning just to see, but there was, I remember filming the, the uh, Mark Cushman and several people are always big about the whole, why did Gene Kuhn leave? Right. Yeah. And um, the only quibble I have is that I remember Mark is very strong in the whole, Gene, the two genes fought over how much, or it evolved this way, and then Gene kind of got focused back and didn't like that Gene Kuhn was introducing so much humor in. And I remember right. Mark going out there, and I know Andy Richardson, who was Gene's assistant, has said has thrown water on that and said, no, it wasn't about that. It was just he was yeah. exhausted. They were all exhausted. And, of course, he was dead five years later yeah. from, from, from lung cancer, from smoking yeah. his little tipperellas so much. And, um, and I remembered... Like not throwing water. Well, another thing, I didn't know what Mark was saying, but uh, course, I think yeah. um, Ian, the interviewer, asked me. He said, "Well, do you think it was because some have said, some say, it's because they differed over humor, blah blah blah?" And I said, "No, I think there's, you know, I've had firsthand witnesses tell me that that was not the case." So I'm a little. The one thing is, like in the book, I I was saying that they left over humor, and then Mark gets to jump. Mark Altman gets to jump in and say, "That's not true. It's not true." And I was like, "Wait, I'm always the one who's tamping down Mark Cushman." <laughs> uh yeah i uh so anyway that's my one little weird weird moment in the book and it's no big deal it is no big deal at maybe all maybe i should check I, in on this myself in here but we'll that's an there. example of the rashomon you were talking about there it is and i'm i'm i didn't think i misquoted you in there but I, well um, I, yeah. I may have said something and but you were looking at the interviews raw the way they weren't edited so it's true and and sometimes i would break. i suddenly turned into the champion for uh saying <laughs> that was the case and anyway the uh i'll i'll check on that but the um i know sometimes i would like It'll break up an interview into like you know you you talk for like a bunch of you know right oh no you have, and then i like chop it up into paragraphs and kind yeah, of like, yeah, reorganize yeah, yeah. it to. that way so maybe on like page five of this this discussion <laughs> you, you actually get back around to being like it's it's not the case at all might have been no it's but it's, uh no you had a you had a now that i found out you didn't even get to look at the edited episodes no and That's you know i think amazing i think i appreciate it i i remember distinctly mark altman talking about how and i think because i think this does get forgotten about too a lot it's like gene coon was working on the quester tapes with with roddenberry mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. before he died and like he had been asked to come on board 
uh, the animated yeah. series and, and just said no, cause you know, they weren't paying much. And, and, and it, so it's like, I don't feel like there was a big rift. I think they're also like at the time there was such a turnover well, of showrunners just yes. every, in every show, no matter well, my what. My thing is if there was such a rift, why did he have an order? He had like a contract to do eight or nine scripts the next year and he only delivered three or four of them. All is the, you know, the Lee Cronin. Right. Yeah. Well, of course, of course. And, and, and that was interesting too, to hear about kind of the season three writing of it all, where it's like, there were or not. or not yeah exactly it's like the the the, the you know because I, I believe as i understand it gene coon was kind of he a lot of those season three scripts were kind of like first drafts that then were rewritten extensively uh, by other people partly just for production reasons but right. um but that's really interesting i know dorothy fontana talks about that a lot too how, like mm -hmm. she had written she was meant to write more i think and then like she saw how um fred freiberger was kind of running things and it's just like i'm i'm getting out of here uh which uh you know because yeah i mean the budget but then even like david gerald will talk about how like the budget really wasn't cut that much so it's it's really interesting how some people the season three is clearly has a lower budget but you know there's also versions of that story as well which is really interesting yeah and then they go and splurge on spacesuits and then, <laughs> on space suits, yes. and then ralph Saninsky gets fired over the over them and it's not his fault but as a director, yeah which was also very interesting how like the, even those spacesuits were like a very last minute kind of shift around, which, you know, they had Ralph uh, talking in, in yeah. the uh, documentary, which he's like 97 now or he's, something like that. He's 90, he maybe 100 this year. No, I got could to, be, I finally got to talk to him a couple of years and I had it's great with the Portales and then um, Portal 47 and then we use it on Trek files some. But yeah. um, so we're we're sitting here swimming around the original series and Next Gen has had its share. But I mean, like, yeah, you got to touch. DS9 and Voyager and Enterprise. What was, um, um, again, I see I'm kind of, I, I had thought maybe you'd got to do some interviewing and now it sounds like you didn't get to do much original. So I, so you're depending pretty much on the transcripts that were all the interviews that were done. Yeah. I mean, pretty much they, which they must be a little frustrating because you didn't get to be there to ask the questions you might have wanted it's, to ask. It's true. And like with the star Wars one, like I kind of, you know, I, I took, I had a bit more time, so I was able to do a bit more uh, legwork on my own end. Um, uh, but like the, you know, the Star Trek ones, they were, it was very extensive interviews. I mean, they got mm -hmm. just about everybody like I, I, you know, and did very long interviews with everybody, <laughs> which was very daunting to be like, wow, they're five hour interviews with, uh, oh God, I'm blanking on his name, the director of season two of the animated series. Um, uh, oh, Lou Scheimer. Nor uh, no, no, no uh, uh, Bill Reed, Bill Reed, um, who's, uh, who was great, but like he's, you know. Oh, and oh, he, was, he was an animator, I think. He was, but he directed the season okay. two, the six episodes in season two. Oh, oh okay. Um, okay. And, you know, he's great, but he's, you know, they they talked to him for five hours. And I'm like, that's cool. Great. <laughs> I will transcribe all of these. <laughs> but, uh, so yeah, you, I know. And, wait, okay, no, wait a minute. That That's the other thing. You you did fresh transcripts of all these interviews? Yes. Did But you automated them and then cleaned them up? No. You know, even like automating them, it it and then cleaning them up, it takes just forever. No, I know, it's I know. Like... But to me, the one thing of the whole interview and whatever process, and the reason I like video more, I mean, because I, I did that for twenty years, and it's yeah. like that's like stabbing your eyeballs with it needles. Is, yeah. to sit down. You know, the exciting thing is talking to the person, and even the creative thing is maybe crafting the interview. But the thing yeah. in the middle, yeah. But yeah, you're when when Trek comes out as truck, yes, <laughs> forty billion times, you know, and that, yeah, starters. And I know there are no tribbles annoying, comes out as Trevor. For you to say that you did like all that. them all by hand, fresh. That yeah, just blows me away. But okay. Yeah, it. You know, I maybe some people are better at this than I am, but like I, cleaning up automated transcripts, I find it takes just as much time as just writing them fresh. And then when I write them fresh, I know I haven't missed anything. Yeah, but it's know? a lot it's, easier on the knitting needles in the eyes. It could be. Yeah, I, I find <laughs> either one. It's just like I'm just like. It's it's a you grueling. You must be a better no transcriber what. than I am. I did that was the thing I just dreaded and hated and hated and dreaded. But especially, <laughs> and I would do like hours. You were doing like five hours, so in yeah. four hours and three hours. Ugh. It was it's it's yeah. a, it's an experience. But I think now with like my the latest <laughs> books, I've become a little more selective about what I uh, transcribe <laughs> to. If if I know the quote's not going anywhere, I'll just. It be was like, your. Right, uh, just gonna... It was your landing. It was your landing party. It was your. Uh, it was your baptism by fire you yes. <laughs> yeah yeah um i'm just gonna look in the chat real fast i think 
somebody, oh, Sophia, who's in Portugal, nice. said, uh, who would you have liked to have talked to but couldn't if you if you had the chance to? Um, or, or I guess or they didn't have a transcript for or you would have wished to have done live that you'd had a transcript for. You know, they they didn't get Jonathan Frakes. That would have been great. Um, I think you know he's so snooty and aloof. <laughs> it's um, he's uh that would have been a lot of fun. Um, you know, just personally, like I'm a big Fraser fan, so mm -hmm. I would have talked to Kelsey Grammer for an mm -hmm. hour or two, just, just for, for no reason, Captain. just for that little little bit yeah. little thing. Um, <clears throat> but he was I, a I didn't... nerd, which is why he did it. So yes, exactly. Yeah. And like I didn't attend the panel, but I know he did a panel a few years ago at. Uh, the creation Vegas mm -hmm. uh, thing, and mm -hmm. I, I I hope that went up. I hope that went well. I, I would have been fun I, to go uh, to, but didn't see it. But yeah. uh, Melanie says, "Who designed the Tholun web environmental suits? Form fitting, not bulky." Um, I want to say it was, was it Mike Miner? Sure, that I think it's a no. Well, he's a, <laughs> he was a he was an art like art art person. Yeah, but I and I but I don't think Bill Tice does. Maybe he did. Someone's going to come in. Well, and, yeah. I know like they had a suit designed and then like very last minute it got thrown out because it for whatever reason, I don't remember why, but like it, uh, it's in the book. I know there's a story. Like a hard book, suit. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, uh, uh, and that's what got Ralph Zeninsky fired from the episode was that he was going over budget, I guess, on the suits or something. Well, he's talking, well, real quick, everybody. So we don't, he, uh, cause he had, he had done, he'd done like five or six shows, little things you may have heard of like this side of paradise and metamorphosis, you know, with Zephyr and Cochran. And the, I mean, he did these classic episodes and handled Spock and new Star Trek. And, and then he got treated like shit because it Paramount had bought them, but they had all the spacesuit scenes scheduled first. And then all the normal, and normally they would have put that last, like a like a new set. They would have put that last so that you did all the standing set stuff, the easy stuff first, and then did the hard later. And and he was a half a day behind after because they were sewing people in and out of the suits, and they didn't even fit like Walter until Monday morning when they started shooting. They weren't even fitted into the things yet, and so wardrobe was still like adjusting suits while they were trying to shoot. And they were and they got Shatner's done first and all his solo stuff anyway. But he had a plan. He's like, he wasn't a dummy. He's like, okay, we're behind. I'm going to make, I already have my plan on the back end when we do the, board, you know, the normal ship stuff. But after two and a half days, the new head of, you know, that guy at the end, Douglas S. Kramer, head of production, who's not a creative guy, just a bean counter, comes in and says, oh, we're not going to be made fun of. We want the industry to know that Paramount's not going to let people run over budget on our TV shows because they were new to, they bought Desilu to have a TV wing. Yeah. And, um, and I'm sure you knew all this, but I just want to make sure. No, it's, uh, you know, it's. He it's got so burned by it. He was he got burned. burned. And then they went out of their way. Instead of, they didn't just, they didn't just fire him unfairly. And he would have brought it in on time by the end of the thing. But they cut in halfway. Then they took out a, they did a story in the trades and said, we just want the industry to know that Paramount's dedicated to being efficient and practical and people like. You know, checks notes. Ralph Sandensky <laughs> are not going to get it. They're like they like blasted him. They yeah. mentioned him as like a bad guy where he'd been directing for 10 years and it, he was blacklisted for two or three years. And he had finally had friends that let him start directing again. But it's like nobody. He was radioactive for a couple of years. I was like, Jesus. So he was so burned on Star Trek. It wasn't until about 20 years ago he would even start talking about it. Yeah, I mean, and he's, you could tell he's still very bitter about it, and and rightfully so. I mean, he's it got, feels yeah, like he's, he's he's just... Well, he's Douglas, really... I, so I talked to him, like, about six months after Douglas Kramer died, and it was, you know, mm -hmm. the, not the first head of production for Paramount, if they bought... And I said, to, and he just recently passed away, and he said, he looked up and he goes, uh, I shed no tears. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 50 great. years later. Yeah. Anyway, anyway, let's talk about the, the other series. I mean, what was... Yeah. What um what surprised you? What was what did you feel like maybe you were getting to talk about for the first time in public, especially like with Enterprise or maybe maybe even the the movie era decade, you know, the fandom revival decade. Well, I think um the big one that stuck out to me was kind of the early days of the next generation, and I mean I don't know if this information was hidden or whatever, the, but the like, chaos on the bridge years. <laughs> yes, yeah. but like the. Uh, the discussion about like you know especially um uh 
Roddenberry's lawyer and kind of just David Gerald's experiences there and and um, mm -hmm. a lot of the kind of nitty gritty too about like Paramount setting up uh, the the syndication mm -hmm. distribution network for Star Trek, which was really, you know, such a gamble, such a risk. And um, and it's so interesting recently just for the Simpsons book I'm working on, they had a executive who used to work at Fox on and he revealed that like they had actually Fox had not only taken a pitch for a new Star Trek series, but they had green lit the series and they had signed the contracts for the yeah. series. And, and there um, were four, they were the new baby fourth. And when they, they, they took it around to all the networks and they actually went to Fox with it. So, but I'm yeah. interested to see what his newest bit was. Yeah. Well, the, you know, it was like they had, they had agreed to do 13 episodes of the next generation for Fox and, uh, and, after the fact, Paramount just changed their mind. And kind well, of I think contract. that's where, G see, Gene was so, the thing, you know, every pendulum swing is a swing away from the thing before. Yeah. And coming into Next Generation, aside from Gene wanting a throne back and, and, and financial viability and not having Star Trek taken away from him like it was in the movies. Yes. Um, he did not want to fight the, now we say being on the bubble, but the whole thing about, you know, the censors and the network suits and he wanted guarantees and that was starting to become a thing in deals. I think so. And he wanted way more than a 13 commitment. And that's why the Fox deal went down. Yeah. And I also wonder the Fox if Fox guy if... may have thought they sold it, but right. <laughs> well, I, you with, know. no, we want at least a season. We really want three seasons or something like that, you know, which was un insane and unheard of. But he's saying, I'm sorry, this is Star Trek. This is not Joe Blow's startup, you know, series. Right. Which is interesting, too, because at the time, that's that's a, a lot of moxie to have about mm -hmm. a very because nobody in the industry thought it was going to do well and like all the you know it's so interesting now because like actors the yeah i mean you know we we for me like i <laughs> i grew up watching star trek these people were huge in my life and yet to like think back to what the point of view was of the industry at the time in 87 like none of these people were household names except like people knew of lavar burton and uh, will whedon but and they weren't like whedon. stars i mean to I mean, well, you know, uh, but like uh, to think back about how like how crazy it is just to hire all these people that no one had ever heard of, give a show that, you know, and we look back at season one now and like season one doesn't have a big budget. Well, um, we have the casting notes. They they were shooting for the moon for people, but they didn't want to, you know, they had their wish list of people and people they, wishes, they yeah. weren't going to get and probably couldn't afford. But yeah. they were going to at least think in those terms. And a lot of mid-level people were like sci-fi. Yes. And, syndic and syndicated yeah and a yeah. sequel that's like rick berman would say sci-fi syndicated sequel is radioactive nobody wanted to touch yeah it. yeah and you know it's it is fascinating to look back on season one too and how many of those episodes are actually just bottle episodes like what we'd call them today it's like they're usually set on the enterprise they're uh, standing sets and if they go to another ship it's the exact same sets mm -hmm. as the enterprise <laughs> and and uh you know, dealing with with kind of sci fi concepts that uh, don't cost a lot of money. And like it's uh, and then to look at even just two years later and how like because of the success of and it was a huge success when it came out that the budget just starts to go up a bit. And, you know, you start to kind of fill out the world and, and it becomes the show we, we love. But it's like, well, they also you know, got the amber. I mean, they started they had that enormous warehouse of set pieces and props. Yes, and of course. Yes. Exactly. And so it, that started to build it. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I think like the interesting thing for me was kind of just learning that kind of nitty gritty stuff, you know, and, and it's stuff we, we can't ignore, but it's kind of Gene's, you know, descent, I guess, during that time. And then like his, mm -hmm. but also just the weird, you know, stuff about how like, you know, Paramount was still claiming the original series was an epic failure. And like, <laughs> he, you know, Gene had to like do some fancy work with the contract or Gene's lawyer, right? Rather, uh, Leonard Mazelish had to do some fancy, you know, fine print stuff on the contracts to make it clear that like they could hire accountants to come in and like look over the books for the mm -hmm. whole franchise. And once they did, it's like Roddenberry suddenly starts getting very large checks in the mail. <laughs> and it's it's just so it's because Hollywood's still doing that. And a new it's Lincoln like, or a new continent. Yeah, a new Cadillac, yeah, whatever that was. Yeah. And it's uh it's it's just bizarre to hear that stuff and be like, wow, it's you know, some stuff. Well, just and see, change. Leonard Majorly is like the bad guy who interfered way beyond his means with the yes. writers the first season, being good being the bad cop to Gene's good cop. Yeah. And not letting the movie dethroning happen again, you know. Yeah. 
and and the whole chaos in the I totally get it. It's like, how do you? Gosh, we just went through a, an administration like this. The way you you if you feel like you have inadequacies and you feel inferior about anything, the best way to maintain your position is to keep everybody else spinning in circles, yeah, and stirring up the shit. And that's really what they were doing the first couple of years as his health was going down. And and I think the more Gene's health gave up, the more Leonard got more frantic about it. Until finally, they're like, "I'm sorry. Not only are you writing, and this is against the guild rules." But you're breaking into people's offices and, yes. them and rewriting things in their name. And anyway, yeah, so I'm, you know, I'm really Bizarre. glad for the I always heard this stuff, but I'm so glad that they got the chaos on the bridge doc done and got some of this out there. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, it still burns pe- to hear Dave. Well, they interviewed Dorothy before she passed. Right. They had a fresh interview with Dorothy. They they, Dorothy they I, I think they they purchased an interview that she had done okay. a few years okay. back. But yeah. Yeah, she um, was still, we had her on the Trek files like six months before she passed, and she was looked fine. She was, you know, yeah. I actually went to AFI for grad school in screenwriting, and she was teaching there, and I took her class, and she was just lovely and like the mm-hmm. most, you know, someone who I, I was, I was actually planning just to audit her class again, just you know, a few days before she passed away, and I was just like, what the hell? Like, you know, um, she was, yeah, her brain was still working so great, and like. It was lovely. The whole the, her class was literally just like the history of TV, and we just show up and watch old episodes of television. And she just talk about the industry, and it, it just felt like you know you're you're going to your grandma's house and just watching <laughs> watching TV with her. It's just it was so lovely. And just, but it, the it, smartest TV grandma in the world. The it? smartest TV grandma, yeah, of course, yeah. and, and with the best taste, of course. It's a great great taste in television. But uh, um, but yeah, you know, and like uh, so Dorothy, you know, Dorothy's interview was great as well. Um, I wish, I mean, that's probably one I wish we could have mm-hmm. gotten a, a longer interview with. Cause I think, you know, her interview, I think was like an hour or so. And, and, you know, she goes through kind of the usual, you know, like the stuff that, uh, the go-to stories, I guess. And it would have been really interesting to talk more and try to get into the, you know, stuff that try to delve into right. the memory banks a bit. More, well, and but. you know, everybody's, a lot of the highlights get touched on over and over and over again. And, but every yeah. once in a while you get into a nitty gritty area and uh you're a little mysteries and you're like i'd like to know yeah um so here's a i'm gonna say this real quick i totally forgot i could have done this so <laughs> melanie uh the feinberger and feinberg device the feinberg or as bob once said the feinberg oscillating framazam uh irving feinberg was the prop master so that's where he figures in I just ah, nice. that was an easy Very one cool. to throw off Very cool. so again i feel like we're we're wallowing around in tos and tng and some of these areas like what was like the voyager Anything pop out at you from those? Um, you know, the the Voyager, uh, I mean, Deep Space Nine was fascinating just to hear people talk about, you know, some of the topics related to like racism at the time and, you know, the stuff that wouldn't necessarily make it into a Paramount uh, promotional material. But like, you know, talking about just how progressive it was, but also some of the struggles they had. Um, at the yeah. time, I know like uh, Sirach talks about like a, a really shitty experience he had on on set once where not even on set, but like on the Paramount lot where he like a security guard just like threw him out just like onto the street because he thought he had broken in or something. And it's like this guy's a star of a major television show. Like clearly, he you know, not, not that it just, should make any difference. But I, if I was there I, and maybe he says maybe, you know, but I would immediately say. Not that it makes any difference, but like he started when he was twelve or thirteen. He was very then, young, yeah. And then he, yeah. And then he shot up, right? He did. Over the yeah. seven years. So yeah. I'm like, I'd be like, was this closer to twelve or closer to eighteen when this I, not that either one excuses it, but I no. just understand how that mind works. I'm just But you know, it's uh it's uh yeah, but like so so hearing stories like that, um, you know, Penny Johnson does a great interview as well and talks about some of just the struggles of just like getting you know having a, a romance on television mm-hmm. between two you know black actors it's like it's it's even then it was and arguably even today it's still kind of hard to hard to sell that um to a lot of the the studios out there and it's um it's it's so fascinating to look back on um and i think like the voyager stuff it's um you know it was fascinating to kind of hear about like looking at voyager in relation to its struggles to find its identity Mm -hmm. struggles to kind of find its its voice and its success and now we look back on it and it's like it's one of the most you know it's so successful and for a long time it was like the most watched star trek show on on streaming yeah and it's like at the time though there was it was there was a sense that it was just this big old failure and it's and a lot of the creatives behind the scenes were 
were feeling a bit tired and a bit like, you know, Brandon Braga talks about how like he both, it was the best of times in his career, but it was also like he, he could kind of feel the engine starting to, you know, wear down a bit during that period. I always it's, thought that it was the, I, and I'm, and then <laughs> for everything I thought about Voyager being like a big disappointment or not, not even of its own, but somewhere between the weird, the, the small town ness of UPN as a network yeah. and some of the insane no, you know, and, and, uh, but also just how the pilot was the pilot excited everybody so much and then how everything was immediately backed away from and vanilla yeah. you know yeah. yeah it's like with voyager the three things are you know the kate the the the, the uh, jane way casting that's the big yes. thing and then the kate jerry controversy you know inner yes. thing and how it reflected out but the other thing is just the overall and how some of the characters were just wasted over the years which is sad you know it's true you know, and i think bad. like you know the the tragedy i think of, of jennifer lean who was just you know yeah. i i really like the character of Cass, but like she just you know has had such a, a rough time of it at, at the period and and like you know it's not just i mean it's it's interesting to hear just like how it wasn't just like uh kate mulgrew and jerry jerry ryan contra it was like the entire cast was kind of like you know, you know they felt very like threatened by this you know new you know new cast member coming in in season four and it's um and but that also represented, I think, UPN at the time, too. And they do this with Enterprise as well, where it's just like there was this effort to try to make Star Trek incredibly sexy <laughs> and to try to like bring in all this, you know, younger generation and, and such. And I remember even back then just watching Voyager on TV and like the advertisements were just so like trying to make it look like Baywatch in a lot of ways. And it's just, like, like trashy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like this just isn't what Star Trek is. And and. You know, I think one of the the best stories of all Star Trek is just the fact that like Jerry Ryan just yes, she's incredibly beautiful, but like she's just an amazing actor. And then just like mm -hmm. set in the character became just probably one of the standouts, top ten at least of the entire franchise, which is just mm -hmm. remarkable. And I think that speaks to the writing, it speaks to the acting, it speaks to to so many aspects of it. And when, well, when you finally do a modern sequel series who's the first out of the out of the box character you know on Picard they don't start off he Patrick doesn't want to do a season 8 of TNG he wants to do a loganization of Picard and they sit down to plan all these new characters around him and and even mention but not bring in the old crew but who's the one character they do yeah it's, it's not, very true part of it's yeah. cuz they're both XBs and that was part of the th you know it was like let's get them together to, to to vibe over there being former drones, except he was a former drone for a couple of days and she was for, you know, 10 or 12 years. Long time, long time. But she's yeah. the character that they bring, the legacy character, now that we have all these terms, that they bring in first. So yeah, no, it's amazing what she, you know, to be plastered all over every damn magazine in the country yeah, on the cover in the cat suit when she was cast and announced. And then within a few months, people go, oh, and they totally lose, they still like watching her on screen, especially with their male. Yes. Or any female, I would think. I don't want to be small minded here. Yes. But, but to be watch what she's doing. And when they would get into this, when she, the one where she's breaking down and she's doing the Ferengi and she's doing all the, or the one where she and, and Bob, I say Bob, the doctor and seven yeah. um, switch are switching bodies and, <laughs> and pulling off some of the stuff she did. The comedy was. It's amazing. And, yeah, and it's amazing. Yeah. You know, it's, and good it's so screen. interesting too to hear. Because they, and what a know, weird beginning she had with her, uh, you know. Oh, yeah, it's, yeah you know, and to come to where she is now and happy and everything, yeah. Um, but it's they they also got an interview with with Jerry Taylor, who which was very interesting because Jerry Taylor retired at you know, <laughs> was that really wow? That's, that's well, wonderful. because she was doing that. Well, they were there was a thing, uh, I was offering a silly me, I was offering to help, you know, if where I could, yeah, and uh, I knew they were getting that. Dave and the Voyager documentary team were getting Jerry ready to talk mm. on camera. And she mm -hmm. was like, okay, okay. She's like, for a while, Jerry had this, added, like I interviewed her every year and, you know, knew her back in the day. And then she retired. And when she retired, yeah. she kind of wanted to retire. And yeah. it wasn't just Star Trek. She'd worked for, she had been a late blooming mom in TV, which was part of her story, which needs to be told. Mm -hmm. She had, she was um, uh, Dick Enberg, the sportscaster's wife. They, di they divorced. She basically had the three kids and she'd been a house, uh, you know, a media celebrities housewife. And she, but she had had scripting or English in college and she dived in to write for her own life and then found herself, you know, climbing the little writing ladder and then being a producer and having the opposite, you know, on Simon and Simon and, and Quincy. 
and she had all these great credits and she came to Star Trek totally not knowing anything about Star Trek, but mm -hmm. she knew people anyway, anyway, but she did her stuff. And when she retired, she was, she had a whole industry career, you know, not just Star Trek, but she's like, okay, I'm done. And I'd say something about talking to her in the last 10, 15 years. And she says, Oh, Larry, I said it all, <laughs> you know, we talked for so long back and, you know, and I knew that like this whole new perspective on Voyager and Janeway and what yeah. she meant, Janeway meant to, especially all the women out there and the little girls and everything and, and seven and, um, um, and Bellana, you know, even. Yeah. and so they kind of got her re prepped to come and talk and her health's been better. She lost her husband a couple years ago, but she's, mm -hmm. her health's been better. So I knew that was all a thing and they were kind of, you know, the, the light under the bushel they were going to release for the documentary. So I didn't know if she wanted to talk for this or not. And I kind of said, well, it is going to be a 10 hour. It's going to get a lot of attention. It would be, you know, and she's, you don't have to save it all for the documentary. She could get it. She should be there. She, and so she, everybody kind of said, okay. I mean, I don't want to say, you know, but I mean, I kind of helped get that along. And a couple, I mean, some people, nobody would know unless they're behind the scenes people and nobody would think of unless you, oh, this is a great storyteller or this is a, because we've had them on, I knew them interviewing them. And then we had, we've had them as guests on Portal. You know, we've had them as guests on Portal 40. Oh, you can't see. On Portal 47 <laughs> over the years. So like Mike DeMeritt, who's assistant director, who has tons of great stories. Yeah, but, yeah. So I'm glad Jerry got out and could say, you know, and get her piece out there. Because it's dawning, this last couple of years, it's dawning on her how much Janeway and how much she creating Janeway meant to so many people. That is back in the day, like you say, back in the day, we're just trying to get scripts done and stories and dodge the network and, you know. Yeah, and, you know, it's... Uh, well, I'm sure she did a lot of interviews at the time. Like, I think like it's sad that I think especially her involvement with TNG has been kind of forgotten. You know, like she was kind of the showrunner for the la latter few yeah. years. And, yeah, yeah. When Michael it's, pulled back, she was. Yeah. Yeah. And yet everybody instead remembers, you know, the Ron Moores and the Brandon Bragas and all the, you know, because they're out there still talking about it. And, and mm -hmm. you know, it's then they have their own stories and they talk about those stories. So like Jerry kind of gets, you know, forgotten about. But it's like she was Crusher the and of. Crusher and Troy in the command track. Uh, yes, our Jerry. Yeah. yeah. And, and also she... even the extras, like extras crew walking up and down the corridors, you'd see yeah. they quit being all 25 year olds. <laughs> and, no, I mean, some of them and they weren't in prime. You know, they started adapting the uniforms. They started having people in their 40s and 50s. Yeah. Gray heads uh, walking the corridors. Like yeah. Starfleet is not just for 30 year olds and you, know, you have to retire. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which, you know, and it's I mean, she did like rewrites for some of the most big episodes like page one rewrites and star trek at the time didn't you know they they had a habit of keeping the original writer credited mm -hmm. so if if you know i mean ron moore did the big rewrite on uh, in the pale moonlight which he doesn't get a credit for but like it's basically a page one rewrite he did and jerry taylor did a page one rewrite of uh, the inner light i think it was and like she mm -hmm. you know that's kind of her episode and yet it doesn't get talked mm -hmm. about just you know because mm -hmm. Which is like the most high rated episode of, of the next generation for better or for worse. And it's um the uh the uh she deserves all the credit in the world. And yeah. It's, um yeah. Yeah. Uh well they all kind of did that until <clears throat> Brandon and Ken. Okay. Um <laughs> uh yeah, so is there I mean, so you were you were the I said this was the uh the guinea pig of their book line. Uh, the first of the projects you've worked on in Star Trek, but like you said, you went into it knowing a lot of the shorthand already. You weren't yeah. leaning totally on the transcripts. Yeah. It, uh, do you have any regrets? Well, I mean, uh, it would have been great to have more time <laughs> to, to, uh, <laughs> just to kind of finesse the uh, the the work and and you know, because it's um, I mean, now it's done and it's out there and it's and uh, you know this too, just from writing your own books, it's like you can't you can't really change it anymore. <laughs> it's uh, <laughs> there's still tons of stuff I, I was like, oh god, I wish could I could have just tweak that or add it or you know revised uh, Larry Nemechek's transcript about the uh, Gene Coon situation <laughs> apparently, but uh, the uh, you know oh don't don't like I was, just uh, I wanted to ask you about that because <laughs> it looked like Mark gets to come in and go wrong no <laughs> and I'm like what that's no and yeah. I know uh, one time I said in the sitting down, because I worried about this. One time I said, I either said 64 when I meant 1964 when I meant to say 1965 or vice versa. And I worried, like, I realized later, I'm like, oh, God, they're going to use the thing and not. And people are like, don't you know, that was in 65, not 64, <laughs> or, you know, whatever. Yeah. You know, and that's an interesting like that. point, too, with, with yeah. works like this, where it's like a lot of people do just mix up, you know dates and facts and things and it's you're, there's you're there in the chair everyone yeah, you would know. stop and i would I, every once in a while i was like i want to 
I want to check this before I just say, and I brought a couple, like, I didn't bring yeah. the library in, but I had a couple of notes and I'm like, I want to get this right. Yeah. There was one thing, especially like the, and I don't know if we got into it, the vat, when Gene had the chance to buy Star Trek, like six months after it was canceled and Paramount offered it to him and he couldn't raise the cash to, it was like a half million or something insane. Mm. And I guess they started to get the reports back from the syndicated stations that they had first sold it to. And they were like, like, stop, no, no, <laughs> don't, no. Like, don't sell it for half a million. About the time yeah. he finally had to say no, they were like, okay, fine. Order withdrawn. <laughs> you know, I wanted to make sure, because Herb Solo put a number to that. And if nothing else, I would just quote Herb Solo. But I wanted right. to make sure and have that accurate because, you know, they specifically ask. And I said, no, there's a number out there. It's floating around. Let me find it kind of a thing. So, yeah. And that, that, that period of time, too, is just so fascinating. Like the 70s, you know rising appreciation of star trek and you're getting you know the first conventions you're getting all those like movie development stuff and you know the the gene roddenberry projects that also almost happened and then you know the <laughs> phil kaufman scripts and things like that and it's like yeah. you, you know yeah. you, unfortunately there's not a whole lot known about any of those things but like it's fun just to to, to think about and talk well, about hopefully this. they'll be hopefully they'll be known eventually <laughs> hopefully there's a ton of material we're just trying yes. to like on the Trek and the Trek file my, for one thing, if, if of all the channels out there, the Trek files is this 15, 20 minute format. And we're all, we're all trying to, cause we have scripts. We also have like notes and communications and, and I know like, and I would write in fragments. It's like, we'll yeah. find pieces of a script, but we don't see the beginning and end. So it's like, Oh, they're just rewriting this part. And it's, yeah. you know, and handwriting was... Jean's handwriting. On I mean, just so I think pages. you found like the 20 pages of the God thing. I seem to remember a PDF that, that had your watermark on it. And yeah. uh, that was fascinating to read. And like, just also like yeah, I saw a while ago that you'd found like uh, Harlan Ellison had actually pitched on the next generation. And I was just like, wow, that's because I genuinely and I, I think I talk about this on the book. It's like he was just like, I'm out. I hate Star <laughs> Trek. I never want to talk to these people ever again. <laughs> and and to learn they're like oh wow we actually did well i'll get a check but i get to keep telling my hate story for 50 years but yes. i'll take the check <laughs> i'll take the check <laughs> but uh it's so interesting to be uh to uh to have learned that so it's like i just i love what you're doing you know just diving into doing all this archaeology here for star trek it's fantastic here's uh and then you have to but the format you're doing is like you have to move on so jr says lavar merchant mentioned on the view that writers couldn't get jordy a good romantic interest that's one of the What's one of the, uh, there are the the moments now we look back, even on Next Gen like that. Well, he's clearly the only one that actually has, I mean, I guess Riker has kids too, but like he's, he's, he's got kids now. So he's, he's, he's done all right for himself. Theoretically, yeah. theoretically, I guess. Yeah. Um, uh, do we have any theories about who the mom is on, uh, cause Jordy has referred to a, a mother right. character. So right. it's, uh, who do we think that? Oh, I would is? so love it if it's, cause it would just blow people. Cause it's amazing how much they pull like I the minute I heard I saw what they had named the two girls. I went, wait, that's two that that's two of his fake future Q future kids. That's right. Yeah. From all good things. Because the whole right. all these years, the whole thing, the the fake Q, Brandon and Ron at the time said the fake Q future is where we get to do all the fun stuff, like have the ship go warp 13 and have three yes. cells on the Enterprise. And yeah, you know, it was the dumping ground for all the stuff they just like were kind of tweaking the form. Oh, and yeah. having the visual effects had the they finally got to break their horizontal plane that's right Everything yeah happens in space like this and so the whole attack yeah. thing was just to go ha ha we got to do a vertical <laughs> attack yeah and the whole and but having him they were gonna name they were going to name jordy's wife just it's a name check right in the scene they were gonna make it aquiel mm. because that's who they always intended for him to finally bond with but the episode wound up so horrible they were going to redeem it with mentioning it. And then they went, no, do we even want to bring that up again? And then they made it Leah for Leah Brahms. Yeah. Even though she was married at the time, but it's, you know, people are grown ups and they get married, they get divorced, they maybe whatever. Sure. So I would still love it if they had it be Leah, but I bet there are people that would, that, that would explode their brains. But she was married. I, 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 I mean, I they already did creeped, that. They he with creeped the... on her. He hollow creeped on her. <laughs> so, but they, re, they made up by the end of their little arc. So. Yeah, and it was, I, mean, I would definitely love Leah Brown too. I also wouldn't say no to Sonia Gomez coming back into the picture just for a bit of that. Because I know initially that was talked about as a romance element. And then like the mm -hmm. actress was unceremoniously let go because I think she got a haircut at some point. And Paramount's head guy was not thrilled about that. But uh, 
It's a lot of hair obsession with Paramount. Had, it's period. amazing it's, the hair obsession over the years. It's so bizarre. Also I learning about that. that about, like the... But they had her back for she did the lower decks uh captain son. Well, yeah, that's like 30 years later. <laughs> it's um, I, you know, I, that's I, before it, the time of Picard though. That was. It's like 20 20 years I guess yeah, before it's Picard. Yeah, so before it's, Picard time. Yeah. Um uh but yeah, it's that and that was also something fascinating to learn about was just like they like reshot like a huge amount of the Voyager pilot cuz like the big guy at paramount was just like i don't like her hair and it's like that's like millions of dollars you're spending here just yeah. because on location on back location at Pacific yeah. center that they just oh yeah the la convention center had just opened and they were the first thing to shoot on location in there yeah, but madness madness um and we barely said anything about enterprise, enterprise. yeah uh, you know enterprise i i that was really interesting too because like that i think and I think I speak for a lot of Trek fans as well. It's like Enterprise is kind of the one show that maybe we aren't as familiar with. And that's not fair to the show. And I think what's what's really interesting for me is to learn more about the production, learn more about the stories there and and kind of grow my own appreciation of, of the series and be like, you know, they were really doing some interesting stuff, um, especially season three and four get really good. And mm -hmm. uh, hearing about just what it could have been with season one had, you know, their initial pitch because initially their pitch was like, we want to do the right stuff for star Trek. The first mm -hmm. season won't even take place in space. It'll be all on earth developing stuff. And I'm like, that sounds amazing. Like, let's do that. Cause yeah. that's, that's the interesting Bam stuff. And a can part two. <laughs> and <laughs> you know, instead we get the, right, uh, the very quick, you know, very quickly enterprise kind of in season one anyway, kind of de turns back into a, a, another version of star Trek. And, and I think it's mm -hmm. like, you know, it and it took them a while to kind of reorient themselves, I think, and figure out just what the show would be and could be. And by the time season three comes around, though, it's like it's a good show. There's a lot of great stuff happening. Did, did you? Well, I had the uh, <clears throat> a year or two after cancellation from a from a right hand source. I had kind of the whole history of the projection, the, the trajectory of the love affair and then suddenly not with yeah. UPN and about Les Moonbez taking over, you know, UPN was this little silly, th every two years they had new executives all running around thinking they were running a network and they were, <laughs> such and even out of the gate, the WB and UPN were like the little guys, but the WB had so much more solid shows and an identity and a brand. And yes. UPN was just kind of flailing around with their little they number were, yeah. block, their little letter blocks and yeah. shapes until they wind up with the wrestling thing. But um, <laughs> you're like, really, really Star Trek and wrestling? But um, the whole thing about they they were threatened with cancellation. The second season got so thin. Although there were some awesome shows, but it got really thin. Yeah. And I remember Brandon at the time making fun of Michael Pillar's B story and C story. You know, like, oh, we have to have the thing for the ship while they're on the planet. Mm -hmm. But the shows in season two were getting really thin as yeah. much as I wanted to like them. And I was like, wow, it's just like Marauders is just the... Um, um, Magnificent Seven, yeah, the Seven Magnificent Samurai, Seven yeah, from yeah. Kurosawa's. You know, it was like it's just a straight-on retelling. There's no alternate, you know, B plot. And I just thought that was that was sad. And then, yeah. it was like third season was their chance to redeem themselves, and it was going to be canceled. The Zindi year amped up because they were feet. You know, they were backed against the wall, and then yeah. fourth season was totally borrowed time, and yeah. it was one in a million. They and so. To the outside world it's like why do you cancel it when it's finally at the best and it's finally the show we thought it would be it's because it, it was pre ordered anyway, anyway you know and it's true and so I, I'm like, I don't know how much of that you got to get into and how much. i i remember watching the episode the watching the center seats enterprise episode thinking they didn't really hit a lot of that on the head or maybe they didn't get to it or whatever but i um, i we we i definitely talk about it in there and i know manny Cotto talks <laughs> about it at great length and like kind of what yeah. he would have wanted to do with a season five and which is really interesting mm -hmm. and like uh because you're not even just talking about like the end of, it, of star trek but you're also talking about kind of the end of upn too like they were just falling apart and yeah. like and you know rick berman tells the story of how like they were executives literally pitching like let's have boy bands and yes. in star trek and it's, but that it's was this... like that was out of the gate <laughs> yeah well yeah that it's, was uh, yeah that was in the beginning yeah it's, it's just so bizarre <laughs> and it's like you know it, it it's so interesting to look at long-running franchises not just star trek but like you know uh any like I, you know, I, I love horror movies and horror movies oftentimes do this too. horror movie franchises do this too, where it's like at the beginning, they're fresh, they're new, they're 
capturing the zeitgeist. And then after a while, and we don't start... know we're supposed to like them for 40 years yet. Yeah. Well, yes, exactly. Like, the, like, like the first time you went to see star Wars, you didn't think you'd be talking. No, about it was a one and done. Movie. Yeah, right. it was absolutely. It's a one and done movie. But like, <laughs> I think the, the, the trajectory of a lot of these franchises though, it's like, it starts out capturing imagination, but then like after a while they start to feel like they need to be chasing whatever the public is looking for. Like at first they're creating what the public is looking for. Uh, the they're creating something that the public doesn't know they want and then they they realize it and they're like oh my god star wars is the greatest thing ever you know star trek is so wonderful so amazing but like uh after a while though like a lot of these things they start to chase what they think the public wants and then that's kind of when things start to fall mm -hmm. apart and i think like enterprise kind of falls into that category where it's like not even necessarily the writers or whatever but just like the people the, the studio the the you know people who were making these big decisions were like what is the public want to see out of star trek as opposed to like what works best for star trek and it's a it's a shame because like once enterprise really does kick into gear it's great and it's it's so strong um but it just takes a little while longer i mean there's you mentioned marauders i i still like shake my head at that one episode where it's like archer is just in sick bay and that's the whole episode like Porthos is sick or something. And like, that's, I think that they were trying for a thing? comedy, but, but like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It just doesn't play <laughs> at all. And I'm just like, what is Porthos what? is in the tank. That was in the tank. Yeah. And there's yeah. like, clearly he's a fake dog for a lot of it, mm -hmm. but it's, uh, it's just, they like, were very uh, proud of that. I have a photo of the two dogs of the real Porthos next to the fake dog. <laughs> really? And there's not, maybe if you would zoom past, you would. Uh, I think HD, it kind of comes in <laughs> a bit clearer, but yeah, yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> But it's um they were still two years away from HD. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, uh yeah. you know, yeah, and it's really <laughs> interesting to hear, especially Manny Cotto, because I think he's very he was very frank in his interview and mm -hmm. uh which is great. And you know, they had Andre Bormanis on who's wonderful as always. And um, you know, uh they had some cast and crew as well from from Enterprise, um, who, you know, it's interesting to hear their recollections. I mean, now, you know, they're yeah. uh rocking the, was, uh, they had a lot of david livingston i think they did yeah he was the most prolific director coming yes. from being a producer yeah it, and that was interesting <laughs> too to hear his stories of like the early days of tng because he started out as like the line producer mm -hmm. i believe and mm -hmm. and to hear kind of his his recollections of just trying to make this like very low budget sci-fi thing work and you know the first time they they did the wig fitting with patrick stewart <laughs> and hearing that story it's just like yeah, that sounds like a great idea right there. <laughs> but it's, uh, um, you know, so yeah, it was all very interesting stuff. Uh, Rose, who's in Germany, uh, I think I saw this announced. Had they had they talked about the DVD set of the, uh, or even well, she's saying the raw interviews, which I don't know about that, but at least the DVD yeah. episode. Yeah, the episodes are out <laughs> right now, and mm -hmm. you can buy those the, on DVD uh, on Amazon right now. Um, I think there are some deleted scenes on there, but I, I don't uh, I don't imagine you'll get the full raw 10 hour uh, Larry Nemechek interview anytime soon. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but why would you? Yeah. Yes, yeah, so that's what the podcast. <laughs> Let's is. check this <laughs> top of my head. Yeah, for a minute. Um, well, it was what well, the cool thing was about the series. They project they started off with eight, I think. And then after they delivered the first of uh, the rough of the first two History Channel said, oh, do a couple more of these. And so those two that are kind of like theme episodes got added on later because it was always, they didn't want to get into the modern, they wanted to end with enterprise, right? Yeah. They didn't want to start up with the modern. Yeah. Uh, I believe it's like 11 episodes. <laughs> and, and have enough distance to be able to do a good job of documenting. Yeah. Um, it's, and, it's and have the statute of limitations end on telling stories. <laughs> right. Of course, when do, when do those actually end? I feel like it, they, it keeps going up in number every year. It's like, uh, but the uh, oh, I yeah, was thinking so the was... social media was getting shorter and shorter. But... Right, exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, I believe there was eleven episodes total, and I know they did an episode that was specifically about like uh, favorite ships and like mm -hmm. ship design and things like that. And you know, I kind of elected not to necessarily mirror that their episodes format just because like i know with the right. ship one especially it's a very visual thing um and you know it would have been a little harder to to showcase on the written you format, can only so. take so much of people of verbality of ship porn yes exactly <laughs> exactly Reading people going on and on and on about uh yeah Although it was fascinating to hear, you know, from the designers and, and their work just oh, yeah. designing the Enterprise, both for the motion picture, but also, you know, for the uh, next generation and kind of 
you know, stuff that I think a lot of viewers just take for granted. It's like, yeah, here's a set and we're on this set. But it's like the set design and production design for Star Trek was just so gorgeous from the word mm -hmm. go. And, and that's part of the reason why season one of TNG looks so small is because they spent a shit ton of money on their sets. <laughs> and it's, uh, you know, and then and, they had and then they had a DP that shot them all muddy. And yes, yeah. exactly. But who didn't, uh, who didn't stay long. And then Marvin Rush was like a part of the, it's like third season was Marvin Rush on stage and Michael Pillar on in the writer's room. And and I think uh, uh, Bob Bob Blackman as the costume designer as well, Blackman, who's I think a very <laughs> important aspect to the third season. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, too. I've been rewatching the third season recently and like it's. I think I'm just noticing it for the first time, but it's like there is actually like a, you know, we all love the redesign of the uniforms. Well, they, but there's actually they, like they were expensive. They had to cycle them in slow. They had to cycle in, but like yeah. I think it's interesting that there's actually like a proto version of the new version we get for like five or six episodes, and it's kind of like a, a, it's more of like a rounded top up here, which I think wasn't intentional. I think maybe it was like they tried for the straight, but then just the body contours kind of made it a bit more round. And well, I think there's like a little bit of like a pleated yeah. kind of cut down the middle. It looks more tailored. It looked thicker than the well, later part of it uniforms. was the original ones were the it was spandex. It was and they spandex, were not, yeah. Telling their backs. Yeah. But it was all in one piece. And, you know, and I think part of what they did going into third season was a lot of the background people still had that they may have tried to rejig the collar but they cut it in half they made it a two-piece right right right, right. You know, or they give them black pants and take the top yeah and you see background people still with the old yoke collar yeah times in the, yeah yeah they which try to know, modify just, it a little this is part of the thing of television right it's like you can't just suddenly produce you know 200 new costumes overnight it takes some time it's just to... a replicator file what's the big deal? <laughs> it's just a molecule yeah it's, it's nothing you just 3d print that shit yeah i've got this there. comment here from dominic uh, Negro, who says the IMDb reviews of the current Trek shows so how far we need to go to get to the Trek feature. They yelled woke Trek from the first episode of Strange New Worlds, which is amazing now because the same thing happened with with Discovery. But Discovery became the show that everybody kicked around for a long time for various reasons. But now everybody's, oh, Strange New Worlds is best thing since sliced bread. But that's true. In the first episode, Pike walks on the bridge and without Spock there, you realize so I was like, it's all women on the bridge. Well, that's interesting. But a, a lot of people that wasn't interesting. It was like, Rrr. but um, it's, yeah, it's a sign that some of that's the online aspect. I still say when you're at a, where are all the hater fans when you're at a live convention, when you're at a live event, no one sure. talks that way and acts that way. It's only, you know. It's only online. And I think, you know, I think it's, you talk about this in, in the interviews, but it's like Star Trek's always been, that way like it's this isn't new this is uh regardless of what the quality level of any of the shows are it's like it's always been accused of you know pandering to uh modern sensibilities and it's so interesting what a concept, like an entertainment property that panders to modern sensibilities <laughs> because it wants to survive with the best numbers and profit margin what a I, I it's like well i think it's so fascinating to i i this isn't star trek but like i watched an old convention panel that was done in 77 for Star Wars. And, uh, you know, Mark uh, Hamill and... Um, uh, Gary? Yes, Gary. I'm just having to switch my brain over to Star Wars. But it's uh, uh, Gary Kurtz, who's the producer. They're doing oh, this Kurtz. panel for, uh, for you know, for sci-fi people to try to drum up interest for Star Wars because it's before Star Wars even comes out. And, like, the questions are all just so, like... Like, you know, are you going to have a diverse cast like all these stupid people on TV are doing right now? And, and it's just it's like, why, why would you even ask that question? But this is a question that was coming up in 77, too. And it's it's just like nothing is really new under, under would the sun. Would you have a diverse of, cast like all the stupid people on TV are doing? I, I genuinely don't don't understand. No, we're going to do our like, best to stagnate and yes. represent the smallest <laughs> slice of the audience, both, both uh, uh, aspirationally and economically we're going yes. to try to <laughs> it was it, it was so crazy because i i heard that and i was just like good god like this really has been you know people have been complaining about this stuff for, for the decades, pew -pew, decades the pew pew boys yeah yeah um, but it's uh you know and i think yeah and uh, that's been interesting to hear about with the book as well is that like it's you know the kind of the harlan ellison people who are just like star trek's not real sci-fi we we have our we like sci-fi differently and it's just now we look back on Star Trek as being kind of like one of the best aspects of science fiction in the last, you know, hundred well, years. Certainly, 
it's certainly, I mean, if whether it's just like, hi, I'm a card king member of a sci-fi, being a sci-fi fan, or yeah. it's just being exposed to the ideas or just th thinking about possibilities, whether they're in the future or right now or whatever, and whether it's social or technological or, or whatever. Yeah. Um, but you no, know, that's the old, that's the, the original gatekeeping was the media lit con split. Yes. And it's like, well, this is, that's good that you enjoy Spock, but you really need to read your foundational, you really need to read <laughs> your Asimov and your Heinlein and your go down the, you know. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, you're not true fans if you're not reading all your basics. <laughs> Fine. Why don't you guys just go off and start your own convention if this is, if, you know, and they're like, fine, we will. And that's bang. So yeah. that's why I say I look at around at Comic-Con, you know, of all the different franchises. And I go, you do know that this is here because of Star Trek. <laughs> like, yeah, you do yeah. know that, you know, it's because the true. comic convention used to be old guys rifling through dirty, dusty boxes of comics. And that yeah. was a comic convention. Yeah, it was that was a comic convention. It's, yeah. Uh, yeah. And it's, you know, it was really great, too, just to like hear about the stories of just you know the 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 convention scene in the in the you know 70s and and mm -hmm. just how like you know like i wasn't a comics fan why would i go to a comic yeah and you know it's uh mm -hmm. i don't know if i added any of this into the book but like it's i just to learn more about even just like the star trek comic books which have been especially in the 70s were just wonderful and just yeah. you know a lot of the uh the the news news strip comics that came out after the motion picture that kind of carried on that storyline they're they're fantastic and, and use those that era and those yeah well, my friend rich handley's working i think he's been yeah. like an expert in all of that and he's fine i think he's finally working on a book or something oh it's great i know he was so yeah he was so <laughs> instrumental with getting a lot of the when eagle moss was still a thing like they were they were doing some great stuff over there mm -hmm. with their with their releases well, back in the day, the <laughs> first time he got to write was articles for me for the Communicator, oh, the Communicator awesome. magazine. Yeah. <laughs> I'm looking at some comments here since we've been, and I should let you go. We've been at this for, I, oh, no, I, I mean, I love talking. Tracks, I know, so I know. See, uh... this, 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 see, you're being taken advantage of. Because of your life. <laughs> That's what we all get in trouble for. Uh, I'm just looking at some of these things. So uh, this is a, we talked about this, but Jerry, how much does the network influence what episodes get made as their control of the integrity? It depends on the situation. And that's why Gene wanted to be syndicated and not have a network yelling at him. But then it came back around with little tin pot UPN. Right. Yeah. Um, yes. Linda, Jerry Taylor, unsung. Well, hopefully between the center seat, between the Voyager dock, Jerry's going to have one good, you know, or more than one victory lap here and get her, get herself out there. I hope so. I know she came to the, uh, convention the mm -hmm. vegas convention in 2021 and i, I, I she, yeah she's i hope she goes to more too she's you know she's, she's great. got a different mindset than she had maybe five years ago yeah you know it's she's it's so interesting i think she's us in humble. hollywood like we we know that i don't know for me it's just the idea of retiring it's like that just doesn't exist for people in hollywood like we're gonna keep working until we die of bitterness and old age and it's like <laughs> and you know it's it was so refreshing to hear just like jerry taylor talk about how like yeah she retired and she's literally been retired for like 20 years and i was like that sounds really nice that's, yeah you know, i don't i don't think any of us will ever get there but that sounds that sounds really well well then we, we were talking about jordy's wife and people yeah. were like yeah jordy's wife linda says and uh she must be human because alondra said as much as we can tell because <laughs> all aliens were looking human, like ninety percent of the aliens in the original series were human. That's very um, true. And she thinks Sonia Gomez. Of course, now if I was trying to do the math on this, if Sydney if Sydney's older than Alondra, and so if she's if she's a uh, if they're ensigns, so if they're like 22, 23, 24, 25 ish. Yeah. And this is twenty four oh one oh two. So then we're talking about 20, uh, 75, 76, 77. So it's like before Nemesis. Do we, though, do we know how much time has elapsed in the three seasons of Picard? Because I, in the third season, Picard even references to like stuff that happened mm -hmm. years ago that was, would have been season one of Picard. Or was, it a, so, was it a flashback or? No, it was like, uh, I think he was talking about like data's death in season one and like referring to it 
as years ago. So I'm I'm kind of just wondering if like well, the pandemic did it to him too. It did it to him too. Yeah, no, it's, we have I just no wonder if like it could be maybe more like the, the series takes place over like five years or something. I just I I'm sure some somewhere they they've, solidified they've, that, but like, well, they've uh, really solidified this one because it's the the two fifty years after. 2151 so now mm. it's in 01 what okay. what gets me is and i have to i keep talking about this every week but in the first episode of season three doesn't he say oh yes i'm going to be talking at frontier day in a week yes the whole 10 <laughs> episodes, the whole 10 episodes all this yeah. dipping around known space yeah. is all with i keep saying that and they, and they started and then they would say it's 72 hours in 48 hours and the last three episodes it's like it's and i love it now every time they say it it's it's frontier day is hours away. I mean, <laughs> like Jordy just said it, it's hours yeah. away. And it's like, hours yeah, away. Like, yeah. Micro warp drive filter hours. Yeah. Away. Are yeah. you going to try to get to that, uh, IMAX screening and, uh, here in LA? I, I will week? see. I'm going to see yeah. that going. Um, it looks very exciting because apparently yeah. frontier day is going to be quite an event. So it's, it's uh, yeah, it's the new thing. Um, <laughs> JR says, whoever it is, she can say, whenever you're touching the engines, you're making me want to divorce, Jordy. <laughs> Very good, JR. Um, well, this is what I was going to say, Scott. We're talking about Janeway's hair. The, her, her, they, she just started off with her normal wedge, which is what Kate wore. And by the time it was all said and done, that's what they wound up with. Yeah. You know, after it, two or three years. They... There has been a couple of pictures that have come out recently of the original shoot. Like they really tried to like bury oh, I've that had footage. Those. Yeah, yeah, you, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. Well, had, we we showed those at cons years ago. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. But it's uh, yeah. it's it's a little. I, I felt it was a little sleeker than maybe her normal mm -hmm. hair would have been. But and like, she was it looks, in TV Guide with that shot. I mean, when yeah. they were doing the early promo. Yeah, and it it looks good. I mean, I'm just like it looks it looks fine. It looks and fine. you know, the bun. They were trying to grandma. Yeah, it's a weird look. I, I'm not, not a big fan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, some talk here about uh, Kiss. Uh, I'm not going to try to. <laughs> what is this? Ironically, boy bands might have worked on DS9 <laughs> <laughs> over a certain bearded man's consternation. Yeah. Um, 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 such a bummer that there's no Blu-ray. Can't believe we're making DVDs only in 2020. Really? Oh, they're not. Well, that's a that's a startup question. They're talking about for the center seat, I think. Scott. Yeah, I think that's, uh, a, that's a startup cost. Yeah. Production question. Yeah, Blu-rays are and that's, yeah. they're they're pricey, unfortunately. Right. And all, here's our Europeans. Christoph is saying he's from Austria. Center seat TVs are available. They're always reminding me what the European situation is versus uh, yeah. region free Blu ray players, people. They, they mm -hmm. really are. Mm -hmm. I, I order stuff from the UK all the time because it's, uh, mm -hmm. and it, it, it's, it's a lifesaver. It's great. Sorry, Rose. I don't know why I said you were in Germany, but yes, in the UK, I knew that. I'm flipping. This is a, this is the thing I need to let, let Peter go and get on with wrapping up the show. I'm going. I'm going brain dead. Uh, was the season three version one uniform wool and too hot for them? Then the V two was a different material and didn't have the pleats. It looks a little thicker. It mm -hmm. does look thicker. I, I wouldn't be surprised if they thinned it up a bit just to help them cool off. You know, because those sound stages can get hot in in LA. It's uh, yeah, it's, it's a desert down here. I don't know if people know. Uh, that, but it's, yeah, uh... it's a desert. It's a desert. <laughs> Linda says I retired because of the bitterness. <laughs> because of the bitterness. Ah, I see. <laughs> well, You're Peter, I one. yeah, I should let you go. Is there something you want you wanted to say and didn't get a chance to? Or no, I think you know, um, you know, just thank you for having me on. This has been a lot yeah. of fun. It's always great to catch up, and uh, you know, it's I, I hope. Uh, and I hope you'll you'll have me back on sometime. It's always always great to. We'll do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we, it's it's Trek related, but now you you where are you online though? You're not limited to. Uh... I'm not. Uh, you know, for how, how can people follow you, Peter? <laughs> uh, people can. Um, first of all, I guess pick up the book uh, on yeah. uh, Amazon if you all wanted to go pick up the book. Uh, just type in you know center seats, uh, fifty five years of Trek, and I'll take you right to it. Colon. The book. Cool. <laughs> yeah. uh, also, the DVD is on there if you guys want to pick up the DVD. Um, uh, in terms of socials, I'm on I'm on Twitter on uh, Peter underscore uh, Holmes, uh, H-O-L-M-S, and then 1138 after that. Um, so Peter underscore Holmes 1138. 
Um, yeah, you can find me on there. I also host a Star Trek podcast of my own. Uh, Larry's been a guest on a couple of times, and uh, it's uh, the Trexperts Briefing Room, and me and uh, Voyager uh, screenwriter Lisa Klink, we do uh, commentaries for uh, episodes of Star Trek, um, which is really cool. We just had uh, Grant Rosenberg on the other day, who was he wrote like a single episode of TNG season five, but he also had some great stories about just working with Harv Bennett in, in, over the years and like work, being a Paramount executive. Uh, during the time of the Wrath of you Khan. You with Harv Bennett? Yeah, they actually co-developed a show together called Time Tracks yes, in the 90s. Yes, that, like, that was like Harv's last thing. It was, yeah, yeah, and it's uh, two seasons of that. And, you know, Grant was great. He's he's also retired now and just chilling up in Oregon, actually. I have know, to write him like, down. He would be a good portal. Well, he's great, yeah. He's, yeah. He's, uh, he's uh, uh, very, he has a website, and he's, he's pretty active on there. So just, you know, you can shoot him a line that way. That. But yeah, you know, and uh, anyway, if we do one of those, it's bi-weekly and it's, uh, it's a lot of fun. So, yeah. Awesome. That was, uh, what was it again? The podcast? The the Trexperts Briefing Room. Uh, you can find it pretty much anywhere that podcasts mm -hmm. are, are at. Our cost. Well, so, thanks so much. Yeah. And um, uh, thanks for, again, good luck with... Uh, Again, I said I knew you were you were being the guinea pig. You were the first one out of there, out of a yeah. startup publishing line, even with the backing that that Nacelle Company and Peter was going to bring to it. So, um, but anyway, it's got it's been a good experience. And uh, how is that? I mean, is it is it how's it doing? I mean, do you have any ideas since it's because it's mainly Amazon, right? Is the sale force or yeah? I mean, you can it? also find it at Barnes and Noble and uh, oh, good. You know, okay. all, the, all the big uh, sellers I think out there right now. Um, I know it's at it's at Powell's, which is the big bookstore where I grew up, and I was like, "Oh, it's at Powell's. That's so cool." Um, but uh, yeah, so you can find it on there and also on Kindle, and uh, I think it's been doing pretty well. I mean, it's been a bestseller on Amazon for a while, which is great, and uh, you know, so it's it's interesting. I mean, it's it's it'll be interesting to see because it's you know, I I think what's great about this book is it's a nice sort of can appeal to fans new and, and old as well. Mm -hmm. um, but there's also like so much Star Trek books out there right now, including many that you've written yourself. So it'll be uh, interesting to see just like how it, how it shapes up compared to, because there's so many great books out there for Star Trek right well, now. And it's, uh, that's true. So um, we'll, uh, we'll see what happens. So. I, uh, but I always say there's always, it's never, even with the original series, there's always something new to be found, to be sure. uncovered, to be discovered. Somebody to have left something on their deathbed that didn't want out, and then we finally find out about it. It doesn't yeah. actually have to be like the two extra kids nobody knew they had. It could be another insight about, <laughs> about Star Trek. So the hunt, the hunt is always good. To the journey is to the journey. Yes, to the journey. Yeah. Anyway, well, thanks for coming on, Peter. Hey, and thank you for having me. And uh, let me know anytime we can help. Awesome. Thank you so much. Okay. Thanks right. everybody. Well, thank you everybody, everybody for, for listening. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So follow Peter and do all that cool stuff. And uh, I will do that. Thanks a lot, man. <laughs> and uh, okay, let's do a real quick. Um, yes, 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 yes. So if, if you're watching us later on, hey, you're going to miss the live chat and uh, the angst. But thanks for watching us. You can watch us live at 1 p.m. Tuesdays, 4 p.m. Eastern. All you YouTubers later on, I appreciate you doing that. But of course, before I do anything else, I need to thank all of our Patreon folk, um, our TTL club, Diana Hopkins, Robin Wilson, Lawrence Todd, Anne-Marie Siegel, Justin Porteous, Glinda Bruton, Chris Jiggins, Pranakasha Productions, Ryan and Andrew Jasimski, and our live wires, Robert McLean, Byron Bailey, J.R. Poole, Halbert Gunn Johnson, Alan Hohen, Alan, yes, <laughs> Dave Gregory, Tobias Rex, Donna S. Runyon. Hi, Donna. Thank you again. First monther. And Casey Shafsky. It's easy. It's simple. I appreciate everybody helping us out with this end of Trekland. It's five and 10 bucks a month for your shout out. And then the $10 folk get access to the first generation of behind the scenes Portal 47 guest interviews that we did before no one knew how to Zoom. And we were free conference calling. Anyway, there it is. It's patreon.com slash Trekland Live. And we are well launched into season 10 of the Trek Files. So I hope you'll go over and check that out. This week, as we filmed this live, our guest was once again the great. No, not once again. It's his first time on. 
the great illustrator, art designer, ship designer, John Eaves himself, the man, the myth, the legend, the goofball, uh, talking about what's involved when you take something known and prized and wonderful, like original Star Trek, and update it. And we're looking again at some 1987 foundational TNG docs. But of course, it's an issue that's relevant anytime there's a new Star Trek startup or someone's do a prequel or a far in the future show. And of course, John's been there in the middle of all that. So we're over on Facebook with the documents. You can get Trek files wherever fine podcasts are caught. And all the Roddenberry podcasts are at, Roddenberry, at podcast.roddenberry.com. And if you're leaving us now, it's at Larry Nemechek for Twitter, Mastodon, even Facebook and Instagram and YouTube. Please like and subscribe if you're watching this now. Larry Nemechek's Trekland and Portal47.net, your mini con all year long, no matter where your center seat is in the world. Love to have you join us live sometimes you can, but thank you for watching right now. Meanwhile, Everybody with us, hang on. We're going to do uh, the quick break thing, and I'll come back, and we'll dive into the chat and a quick look at the parrots because it's an exciting time. Whew. But if you're leaving us now, everybody, please stay healthy. Do all the things. Stay woke. Check your sources. And trek well. And thanks, Peter. Okay. Let's move on, move on, move on. So, um, interesting. Uh, I think we figured out the Parrot Analytics, which of course is this company that's been around 10, 12 years now, uh, trying to get a handle on digital ratings in a world where the Nielsen's by commercial ad rates don't matter anymore. I mean, they do, but they're only for the broadcast networks. Uh, even though I know you're getting charged for commercials on some channels still. But <clears throat> uh, they use a basically scouring the internet for a, for a, 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 a mean a, a <laughs> an algorithm they've developed called average demand expression, which is basically high level automated mathematical buzz. If they have hard numbers from sources, they factor that in. They do it in countries around the world, not just the U.S., but they publish a top ten. The last few months, I think they've been selling the recent data off to, if nothing else, to a website called TV Geek. But on their own site, they still do put week old week old numbers up, uh, which are still the apples to apples that we've been tracking for years for years now. And what came up last, the end of March, let's say, was Picard doing very well. And I'm just going to jump in. Where did we go? Uh, come on, gang. Boom. There we are. Uh, just recently, Picard was number four among digitals, okay? It was at 45.5 times more popular than an average streaming show, topped by Mandalorian, Stranger Things, Ted Lasso, and Picard. So that's doing, that's doing really well. That's its week ending March 31st. Um, of course, it's not in the top 10. There's only two digitals in the top 10. The top show there was uh, 64.7. So it's kind of a cluster, 64, 60, 49, 45. And then Daisy Jones and the Six is at 41. That's the parrots. That's as of two weeks ago. Now, TV Geek apparently is paying for rights to have the most recent data from Parrot now. And they're showing a demand score, like peak demand, at 45.6, which is about what this is. Um, this is all still in their exceptional range, Parrot's exceptional, which is like the upper four tenths of a percent of all TV, the hundreds of TV that's out there. So it's, it's definitely on a wave. It's definitely on a spike. It's up to, um, I can never quite <laughs> look at these. The spike is up to 49.5. It's going to do nothing but do even more. Just remember when you're on, I mean, I think it's smarter than this, but if you're ever tweeting or Facebooking or, or Instagramming or any, whatever you do, TikToking about Picard, just hashtag Picard, hashtag Star Trek Picard. So these algorithmic ometer scanners can pick it up and there's no, um, you know, every little bit helps <laughs> for the cause, I guess. I don't know what else to say, but that's, you know, now I don't have to tell you that it's been bonkers. So let's see what everybody's uh, talking about. 
So Vox is the next episode. I have my screener. I haven't watched it yet. I haven't had time. It's been kind of a crazy, crazy weekend. Um, hope everybody is enjoying seeing the photos that came out of Yuri's Night. It was the biggest one of these. I'd been to a couple of them in the last 10 years. Of course, two years we lost a pandemic, maybe even three. Um, but um, my friend Amy Imhoff, they got with her. She did an incredible job getting way more Trek celebrities. They honored the Orville. Uh, I saw Brandon again over the weekend. It was hysterical, but um, we had a good chat. But uh, it was a wonderful night. I hope everybody's enjoying the photos. It was fun for us to be there and see all these Trek celebs, especially getting to mix and hang out. And people are still getting over the pandemic and our caution about the pandemic and our slow motion open from the pandemic. And and I still hear of at least once a week someone having COVID. Now, they've all been boosted. It's annoying. And people are just so frozen about not being a spreader that it's like, oh, well, I mean, people don't intentionally go spread flu. So it's just that all of those kinds of things have been so heightened and we were so so burned and beleaguered by the extremes of dealing with COVID. But it's no excuse to not do what you would do, like cover your face when you cough uh, you know, or sneeze especially when it's in flu season. So um, that's, the, I don't want to say that, that totally lent to the magic of it, but we're going to be having that. There's another year. Yuri's Night is a global cause. It's the anniversary of Yuri Gagarin's first, the first person human in space. Uh, yes, even though he was Russian. But it's a it's a landmark for all of humanity. And uh, hey, we got Apollo 11, guys. Come on, we had our share first by the end of it. We can, we can, <laughs> we can overlook a few things. But um, the Space Coast edition of Yuri's Night, they split the anniversary April 12th. It'll be this Saturday over at Cape Canaveral at some of the, on NASA turf. But there are, there are locations all around the world and big and small. We just got to have a star-studded one here. I say we, I had nothing to do with it except going and, and helping promote. So that's happening and con season's rolling up. But meanwhile, we're really all transfixed over Picard. So we'll see what happens. What happens with that? Then we apparently what had seven weeks until strange new premieres, June 15th and June 16th. So um, let's hit the chat. Thanks everybody for jumping in, joining that. Hope you enjoyed having Peter with us. I'll, like I said, I'll try to do this at least once a month, but at least we're open when opportunities come along. Um, I really want to, we may bring some show folk on at times, but I really want to, uh, really want to, um, save that for my, for my headliner spots, but we're going to have fun here. Just opening it up, just opening it. I want to say, uh, I'm going to backtrack. I kind of already ch jumped into the chat with Peter a little bit, so I don't know who all we've got with us today who hasn't said that. Um... Okay, so some folks who choose not to do the chat. This is um, uh, nobody intentionally spreads illness. Thank you, John Kahn. Um, nobody intentionally spreads illness. A heartbreaking number of people just don't care if they do. Yeah, I think it's called selfishness, which is always in abundance no matter what time of era. We just have different ways of expressing selfishness. Um, but anyway, yes, Yuri's night wasn't a mask event. So a few people, a few people were masking, uh, and then we'd doff them for photos. Let's see what's in the chat. It's good to see everybody. I think I saw some new names flying by while we had, uh, Peter on with us. Um, hope you everybody enjoyed that. Um, hi, just Rosie five. Oh, sorry, Sophia. There we go. Hello? There. What is the deal? There. <laughs> uh, just Rosie, I think you're fine. I don't think you're a spammer. So um, I'm glad we finally got you up there. Apparently, you did say yes. Um, it's, hey, uh, Sophia, the whole thing about the Facebook versus the other two, it's not my deal. It's apparently whatever's in the coding Facebook does. And they defeat combined, uh, you know, aggregated chat apps like this and tools. Um, let's see. Questions, questions, questions. Um, whoop, 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 whoop. <laughs> hey, Christoph. 
why is it so cool? I don't know. I'm sorry about that because I was hoping we, we had a good good crowd for Peter. Everybody's still looking for their Easter eggs. It was it seemed like a very muted, maybe it was my perspective. It seemed like a very muted Easter this year. Uh let's see. Actual questions, ask your questions. Ask you all. Um yeah, I know Dave. Peter has a soothing voice. He should do some uh, he should do podcasting. He should do radio. As he used to say, he's got a face built for radio. Oh, he's got a voice built for radios. Uh, absolutely. He could be an excellent nav a narrator. Um, let's see. Let's see. Let's see. We... Uh, huh. Hey, everybody. Let me know if you... Um, a lot of people saw the center seat. A lot of... And there's... There's little bits and pieces. You know, we, we didn't mention Gates. What a great job she does narrating it because the script, the linking narrative parts was um, very adroit sometimes and it would turn on a dime and be very kind of witty. But if you're reading that, uh, that can be a challenge. And I thought Gates did an amazing job of taking their, their script when things would turn on a dime and go with it and make it make sense. So I didn't give a shout out enough again for uh, Gates. So I'm curious. I mean, I know a lot of people have and some haven't. And I think it's now free on Prime. You don't have to see the back. You don't have to pay for History Vault to get the back end. I think it's all on Prime now. Could be wrong. It's on one of the major ones. I don't think it's Netflix. I think it's on Prime for free. Um, if you have Prime, obviously, uh, to app and stream. Uh, but let me know if anybody actually gets Peter's book or... Um, <laughs> or the DVDs, not Blu-rays. Uh, but I knew there would be problems just getting the business set up. And the, like he said, the infrastructure. Um, dum, 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 dum. Anyway, good to see everybody. Uh, we got the Tholian web. And what sh who was it that said this eventually? Um... More like, more like Route 66 to the stars. Yeah, instead of wagon train. Well, the westerns, you know. Uh, thank you. Uh, designed by Dice, Mike Miner built the helmets. That's what I was thinking, Scott. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was the the fu functional structural thing. What would have passed for 3D printing, <laughs> not just being fabrics. Um, but yeah, hard casting would have been way beyond the bounds for budget, much less time. They were still inventing materials for the, for the actual astronauts at the time. Uh, let's see. Oh, these are all Peter questions, actually. Um, ah, oh, who's speaking for the seventh rule today? But that's very sweet of you to say. Um, yeah, Peter's been on the seventh rule and on Star Trek and chill, I think also. Hey, Rose, will there be a captain's chair with multiple captains on Blu-ray or DVD in the future? Well, you know, Dave Zappone's, uh, film company work with Shatner and they did that whole captain series, uh, through Jonathan. That's out there. Uh, oh, did you beat me to this, Scott? <laughs> you may have posted this before I said it on camera. But yes, yes, fine burgers. I mean, McCoy, D called his medical scanner his fine burger. And uh, then Bob Justman would illuminate that, uh, elongate that to, uh, I just remember one time seeing uh, fine burger operating Framazam. Uh, which I think, I think it's, rec B. Joe recorded that in the concordance somewhere. Mm. Chaos on the bridge was eye-opening. My best thing was they got uh, Maury Hurley on, apparently after turning down recent interviews, not at the time in the 80s, but recently, Maury Hurley finally went on camera and talked because he's good friends with Bill Shatner. And Bill talked him into it wasn't even about money or anything or guarantees. And then he passed away within a year of that. I think by the time Chaos was done, he had passed. 
and released officially. But yes, a lot of Chaos in the Bridge was what people had talked about, but they wouldn't talk about it. If you talk to David or Dorothy about it in the old days, they would they would say it happened. These things happened, but they were so burned, they didn't want to talk about it. And then thankfully, Dorothy was starting to talk about it by the time she passed. I think we have her on the Trek files, of, you know, a little bit. And then David, get him off on a topic now, and he'll do it. David's been a very proud papa and grandpa, but I I saw him a couple of times this year at, at Gallifrey, and you can see his posting online, and he's back to being the curmudgeonly truth teller that um, Trek and otherwise that we love. So he's gotten over his uh, I'm above all this and tired of it stage. <laughs> he can do both. He can enjoy his grandkids and, and still pontificate about his time in Trek because he's one of the last – if not the last eyewitness we have to that end of it. Um, yes, I just said that. The cool TV grandma. Yeah, she was. I was so spoiled. When she, it was such a shock when we lost her. Uh, Nam for Siroc. Yes. <clears throat> well, hi, Anne-Marie. I wonder if you're here in your name only. Uh, let's see. Scott, some of the coolest Voyager concepts were abandoned by the end of the pilot, not even after it. Okay, well, I'm thinking about the Paris Neelix jealousy over Kess. I'm thinking about Neelix and Kess themselves. I'm thinking about Chakotay and Paris's controversy. I'm thinking about the whole Maquis Starfleet controversy. Uh, yeah, controversy, conflict. They're all Star Trek. They're all heroes. They're not supposed to conflict. That was the UPN thinking. We, we paid for this to have heroes, not to have them fight. Oh, yeah, this is a whole story that Will tells and that they got Gene and uh, to come over and, and uh, upbraid Bill a little bit about it. Yes. Yes. There was no reason to keep Seven and a cat. Well, it didn't, and they... They did eventually get out. Well, the silver, the most insane one with the insane, you know, whalebone corset in it was what? Just a couple of episodes. That was a, an epidermis regeneration suit was the uh, canon for it. That was helping her heal from all the removal of the surgeries to remeal all her physical Im Borg implants. Uh, this is true, Dominique. This is true. But there was, yeah, there was a lot of, uh, there was some tiredness starting to creep into Voyager 2's writing. Uh, I'll just say, as a lot of the sausage being made, unfortunately, spilled over to the process. Okay. Uh, I think some of these we already spotlighted. Uh, Jerry and uh, <laughs> the whole thing about Jordy's wife. The little things we latch on to. I've, if you've been watching Second Opinion every week, you see that I, I have a little bit of the, little bit of the show is reserved for wacky things I noticed. Hmm. Uh, so, and I almost brought this up, but I didn't get around to it, Melanie. But I didn't mean to overlook it. Talking about uh, some shout out love for Kess and for Jennifer. I have not video, but audio talking about all the casting process. And Jerry, Jerry Taylor talks about when Jennifer walked in the room trying to talk. They didn't exactly have a visual of what Kess would be or look like. Kind of ethereal in a way. But when Jennifer walked in, she physically looked like what they're talking about. But her, you remember early Kess shows, she had her voice was so much bigger than her body. It was soothing. She had that soothing early original Kess voice, but it, it just blew in a live room. It just was far bigger. Her, her, her instrument box, her resonating cavity. Somehow I was like, what are you to her tip to toes? That's all coming out of there. She blew them away. I mean, basically when she read the first time they were like, this is Kess, this is Kess. And to go from that to the, you know, the personal tragedy that happened is, is uh, really tragic. Uh, I, <laughs> Did I say ironica? Did somebody say ironica? Uh, <laughs> yeah, JR, very cute. Very true. Right, right, right. 
Well, JR, that's their bottom line. If they can do both, then that's awesome. Unless it's some exec's pet project. But if it's that much of a pet project, the minute they leave, then it's probably doomed because it's nobody else's pet project. <clears throat> Unless something is high prestige and they're making a ton on syndication and reruns or something, resells. Oh, this is this is all very true, Scott. Uh, maybe it suffers from being a startup. I don't know. Maybe they'll be Blu-ray soon. I don't know. Um, yeah, third season was definitely a uh, definitely an Evo. Okay, we got through our uniform questions. Uh, yeah, I guess you guys weren't typing because you were so spellbound by a guest. That happens sometimes. Uh, no offense taken. Uh, I'm glad you enjoyed. Glad you enjoyed, Dave. Uh, let's see. <laughs> That's his show. Trexpert's briefing room. Mm, 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 mm. Let me see what we say. <laughs> I always try to do that in my Char voice, my my Charlene Sch Schmidt voice. To the journey. Uh... Maybe some fans there for it. Uh, let's see. Oh, parents. Thank you, Christoph, once again. Um, 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 yeah, Glenn, didn't you think so? It was hard. It was hard not to have awesome, awesome photos. Mm, 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 mm. Thank you. It'll be great to see you, Michael, in Indy again in the fall. This is probably true just hoping that covid doesn't keep evolving and suddenly we have a breakout where all of our existing safeguards the vaccinations and things you know the vaccinations that are dropping billions dead as we speak uh have that everything is suddenly rendered moot and useless that would be that would be horrific that suddenly there's some big leap in mutation uh so it still needs to be kept under you know um No further Academy news. Do I think they're backtracking? Oh, Sean, come on. They just, <laughs> they just announced it. It's not like once we announced we're going to give you a steady diet of images and press releases. They're still, I mean, unless they want to have three stages in Toronto, they're going to wait for the little filming of Discovery to happen, depending on what it is. There's a week or two, I think I've heard of filming for the realigned end of Discovery. I got to talk, got to chat with, with Doug Jones just a little bit over the, at, at Yuri's night. And uh, they haven't filmed yet. I think he said maybe this month, but quickly. And so I don't think they'll, if they're using the same, if there's any correlation the way it was at Paramount, like the next gen sets had to be torn down before the Voyager sets could be built. So let's just see. I, I no guarantee that's what's happening. If if the st studio that they're using in Toronto is full up, then they have to wait for. And I'm not I'm not local. Maybe maybe I should uh, develop some feelers for Toronto. But there's some, there's all these practical things. It's not just pie in the sky. Oh, it's Star Trek comes in. We're gonna beam it in with a replicator file on a transporter, and it's gonna come to my cake plate special delivery. No, it's it's uh, not quite that easily. Uh, strangely, you haven't seen every episode yet of the center seat. Oh, Scott. Well, it, it was problematic to see. At the moment, the second half would be all spoilers for one member of our household. Oh, you mean the actual series, not the documentary series, but the Enterprise? Voyager? Just hunker down and watch the rest on your own. Okay, what you do, you, Scott. <laughs> Um, oh, Sean, any idea when the Voyager doc is released? Well, they just finished filming. They said would be the last original filming 
uh, on the cruise a month ago or so. Um, and they're working on several things at once. So I'm, I'm thinking probably not by the end of this year, but I'm sure by 2024. Unless something comes along to accelerate that. Fine, Fine burger, which, oh, you're just... You're just full of it there. And it's, well, the day's farther along, way further along for you, right? How did we never get the Aero Shuttle? And sort of line about not being finished and do that instead of the Delta Flight. Well, look, Sean, the Aero Shuttle was drawn in at the beginning by Rick and, and Mike. And then by the time the show is into four or five years uh, and Brandon's taken over, he's got to infuse it with cool new things and they want the plot. They don't want to just use a shuttle that's looks aeronautical and has been there the whole time. They want to infuse the storyline of Seven helping out with Borg elements and Paris having the rec retro manual controls, the tactile controls and all that. And it's it's become a thing. And they Brandon wants it to be something organic he came up with, not using the thing on the bottom. And yeah. Now, why did it never, ever, ever show up in any capacity like did they ever need through there's one show at least when they had the delta flyer and a normal shuttle why don't they have the captain shot i don't know, maybe it had special capacity and it was like an emergency thing they only wanted to use if they had to use it they didn't want to waste it fuel capacity i don't know um but a lot of it's just human memory well and human ego going on okay scott something tells me we've probably had this conversation before the second the Maquis crew members put on the uniform, the story was mostly done. There are people who gave up their Starfleet careers and everything else. I don't think it should have just been that easy for them to reassimilate. Would have been a great to take at least a season or two with that. Why, you must have been mind-melding with the assistant script coordinator of Voyager. <laughs> My wife, which is exactly what she said. But again, the UPN wanted everybody to be heroes, which meant they weren't in-house in fighting, which, yeah, backed away from the premise. But the Maquis did not have uniforms on until the first episode. Just saying, that final scene on the bridge, who is she to speak for us? She's the captain. They still weren't wearing their uniforms there. So that's one thing that didn't happen until production happened. <clears throat> uh, good, Mona. Glad I could. And it's a global thing. I think there's I think there's a Yuri's night in Moscow. As there should be. That's probably an island of um, science and rationality. Mm -mm -mm -mm. So they might. <laughs> yeah, Kristoff, they might recreate California on the AR wall to shoot the Academy series in Toronto, because I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not thinking that Tillman is going to let them come in and bring a TV crew in to shoot for a day or two or three, or even like a, a light B crew to come in and shoot. Maybe if they, they fly a drone over and shoot over the fence. Ooh, that would be cool. Um, what are you saying here? So, uh, Sean, your favorite bit of Trek set building was the little dock Wesley appeared on, built off the fire exit of production offices, then kept it as a picnic area for the set designers. Talking about the end of season two, Picard, which was in an, uh, an area that was there all along, and they just used it for garden. Dave Blast told us, Dave Blast told us about it on Portal 47. Um... Uh, thank you, Christoph, for explaining ahead of me in the chat. <laughs> Star Trek, cool new things coming 2025. Uh, oh, Sean, you've been listening to too many wild and wacky voices on the internet or even live. Yeah, 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 yeah. Never check themselves for they rest themselves. Well, wow, are we at the end of the chat? I do believe we're at the end of the chat, everybody. Uh, what have we been at here? Two hours. Wow. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. I hope you got the news about Peter. Hope you enjoyed having a guest on. I launched into my, we're still sitting in someone's office, and we're going to talk until we're done talking. I'm not a good TV interviewer. I can be. 
but my preference is to just talk until we're done. That's happened once or twice this year on Portal 47 with some of our new creatives from the new shows. Oh my God, four hours. Four hours with Tim Peel catching up. We had like five years to catch up on. But uh, everybody uh, enjoyed that. Yay, yay, yay. Thank you, Christoph. Looks like the end of the chat too, which means once again, I want to thank all of our Patreon and TTL people and our live wires. Thank you all so much. Spread the word. It's the simplest way to help me do more here. Uh, we're, we're trying to do more with not just what's live, but what shows up on our channels. So that would be awesome if you can. Again, I keep it simple. Maybe I should, maybe I should have the $500 monthly level. Patreon.com slash Trekland Live. That's there. And yes, the Trek Files this week, the great John Eves talking about the difficulties in updating any Star Trek for the time. And our docs, of course, are what was going through people's minds in 1987 on that original brain trust, trying to do the thankless job of catching lightning in a bottle for a second time. Otherwise, all around the, the uh, interwebs, I'm Larry Nemechek at Twitter and even Mastodon. Larry's Trekland on Facebook and Instagram. Please like and subscribe us on Instagram. I think I just went over 2,000 on Instagram. I just We just did some landmark. And most of all, please, even if you're not on YouTube right now, go over and subscribe to us on YouTube. We'd we'll appreciate it. Portal47.net, as I say, is where you can get all the backstage folks. It's all the, the Star Trek you had no idea you had no idea about. Thanks, everybody, for joining us here, being in the chat. Uh, spread the word there. And, um, oh, Mona, I see what you just said here. There should be a mini Yuri's Night gathered around Kate's, Kate Janeway's, <laughs> Catherine Janeway statue there in Bloomington. Yes, I believe so. I'm going to ordain that. I'm going to just say that should happen. Um <laughs> Thank you, Christoph. Like and subscribe on all channels and spread the word. J-R, you are, wait, what? Face, red heart shaped, hand pink waving. Yes, what he said. So am I. Good to see everybody. Join us next Tuesday. Look for the second opinion on Saturday as Picard wraps up. Oh, my goodness. SCE to Vox? No, SCE to Ox. We'll just watch Vox on Picard this week. And um, take care, everybody. Truck well. Stay healthy, do all the things. <laughs> Stay woke, check your sources. And uh, even if it's an empty glass by now, truck well.